Um, I'm, I'm delighted, delighted to welcome you all to uh, our meeting for the uh, relative to the recently released uh, National Academy report on greenhouse gas emissions and information for decision making. Um, and my name is Don Wobbles. I served as the chair of the study committee that uh, wrote that report. And I will briefly be introducing the study and the plans for today's meeting. Next slide, please. The National Academies released the consensus study in October of 2022. Uh, the review charge of the study uh, committee is shown on the right side here. I won't go through all of that. The committee did consider approaches used to develop greenhouse gas emission inventory, as well as their strengths and limitations, and ultimately developed a framework for evaluating greenhouse gas emissions information and to make recommendations for the use of that framework. The event webpage shown here uh, uh, includes the links to uh, the um, report. Next slide, please. This is the committee that put together the report um, and wrote the report. Some of the fellow committee members will be moderating today's uh, uh, meeting. Uh, and on top of this, by the way, we had excellent help from the National Academy staff led by Rachel Silvern and, and, uh, and all the many people who helped her. They were wonderful to work with. Thank you, please. Um, next slide, please. Today's meeting is an opportunity for the committee to disseminate recommendations from a report and, uh, and also for us then to... Uh, extend it even further by looking at um, how this report could be used at the urban scale, because our report mostly focused on the global and national scales. And so we'll be exploring our approaches to quantifying emissions at the urban scales today, um, stakeholder information needs, and the tools available to aid decision making. Next slide, please. This is an agenda for today's meeting. In a moment, I will hand things over to Kevin Gurney, who will provide an overview of the Academy's report. Next, we'll have a session of approaches for quantifying and report urban greenhouse gas emissions, where I'll, I'll be moderating. After a break, we'll take a we'll have a panel discussion on urban stakeholders and, and a pretty extensive discussion about what all this means. Next slide, please. So toward sharing the logistics with you and engaging for the meeting, you're watching a stream of the, of the, of the meeting itself, a live stream. Um, below your video player, you will see Slido, which is a platform we use to take questions for our speakers. Please enter the question for speakers directly into Slido, and you can find our meeting through the event code on the screen. Now I'm going to uh, uh, close. Um, this part, this session, and uh, turn things over to Kevin, who, uh, as I mentioned before, was on the study committee. He is a, Kevin is an atmospheric scientist, ecologist, and policy scientist at Northern Arizona University, where, is he a, where he is a professor in the School of Informatics, Computing, and Cyber Systems. Kevin, it's all yours. All right, Thank thanks, Don. Um, uh, I'm going to give a quick overview of the report. Uh, as Don mentioned, here's our committee listing. I also want to give a shout out to the staff at the National Academy, Rachel, Rita, Rob, Bridget, Saba, Patricia, and Amanda. They were indispensable in putting this report together, especially given the time constraint we were under. Next slide, please. So uh, motivations to develop criteria for evaluating greenhouse gas information. There are really three converging trends that motivated the report. There's been a rapid increase in demand from a large variety of users for information about greenhouse gases across multiple scales, um, sectors, and scales. Uh, also, the development of many new approaches have emerged in the last few years. And then finally, there's um, a growing and rapidly evolving institutional landscape, including public, private, and academic entities 
that are very much busy within this space. So three key motivations to try to put this information together and synthesize what's out there. Next slide, please. So the charge of the study committee, Don already mentioned this. Um, I, I won't necessarily go through it again, um, though I do want to note the study sponsors and that we really were not aiming at evaluating individual inventories. We're trying to build a framework that could be exercised in the evaluation of inventories or other data products, GHD information that's out there. Next slide, please. So um, there are three basic approaches to generating greenhouse gas information, in particular um, emissions flux information. And they come in these three flavors, and I'll quickly describe each of them. The first is refer, we refer to as activity-based. This is probably the approach or method that most people are familiar with. It's what's um, utilized in the UNFCCC reporting done uh, for the UN um, and done by practitioners at multiple scales. Um, the second is atmospheric-based approaches which um, use measurements in the atmosphere <clears throat> typically to infer fluxes or somehow determine fluxes from atmospheric measurements. And then finally, a sort of a new category that um, is a catch-all for, for increasingly integrated methods that both combine the previous two and utilize new techniques um, in this more hybridized or integrated form. Next slide. So as I, as I said, activity-based approaches in their most rudimentary form really are comprised of taking activity data, some measure of you know, vehicle miles traveled or, uh, or some other activity measure, multiplying that by an emissions factor to come up with uh, an emissions amount. I said in the most rudimentary form because these now span a very wide variety of um, techniques and increasingly sophisticated approaches to generating this information, though it still can all be covered by this idea of uh, um, using activity data. Next slide. Here are just a couple of examples to show that spectrum. On the right is kind of your typical sort of table that might be generated by a nation for the UNFCCC, putting different um, emission categories, often by fuel or by sector, and then estimating the emissions amount based on some broad measure of activity data. On the left then might be a more sophisticated approach where you're going down to finer and finer scale, more deterministic approaches to estimating emissions, um, more combinations of activity data to try to both increase the scale, accuracy, and rigor of the activity-based approach and many uh, uh, estimations in between those two. Next slide. Atmospheric-based approaches, as I said, use atmospheric measurements. They can use those measurements directly in um, what's referred to as maybe mass, uh, mass balance approaches or other approaches, um, but you can take the, the information from atmospheric measurements and directly estimate a flux. You can also use atmospheric transport model systems, which has been referred to as the inverse approach. Um, this will take the atmospheric data um, often combined with an activity-based estimate, but utilizing atmospheric transport. In other words, trying to connect the link between a flux at the surface and a measurement in the atmosphere. And the inverse mode means you're really starting with the atmospheric measurement, working backwards to best estimate the flux at the surface. A relatively complicated process, but now been used for three decades um, and increasingly performed at finer and finer scales. Next slide. This is just an example of that um, in sort of pictorial form. On the right-hand side here are a variety of observations, typically concentrations or column amounts, occasionally fluxes that you measure directly in the atmosphere. That could be with aircraft, satellites, ground-based instruments. On the very left-hand side would be a prior or what I, what I refer to as the sort of initial guess with an activity-based approach. You put those together in an inversion or an atmospheric assimilation system, and you adjust the prior according to the atmospheric measurements to get the best estimate, which is often referred to as a posterior. This utilizes kind of a Bayesian setup, hence the prior posterior idea. 
very commonly deployed, as I said now, um, at multiple scales. Next slide. Finally, this hybrid approach, which starts to really just conceive of the problem as um, many, many different observational constraints. They could be fluxes, they could be activity data, atmospheric data, um, all constraining some sort of model system. And though that could include atmospheric transport models as in the inverse approach, it could also include process models of let's say anthropogenic or industrial emissions, process models of biospheric fluxes, um, process models of ocean fluxes, and trying to put all that modeling sort of at the center to best utilize the observations. And it also increasingly is using some new techniques um, such as using optical or infrared high resolution imagery from space combined with machine learning um, to best estimate fluxes as well. So again, it's kind of a catch all of some new techniques, but focusing on the integration often of multiple approaches, bringing them together in some singular systemic estimation uh, approach. Next slide. Um, this is just an example of that, taking that previous picture that I showed, the previous diagram of the inversion, and sort of opening it up now. Now you have all these observations surrounding a central process model. They're all providing constraints. And indeed those constraints might be adjusting parameters within this larger process model. The advantage is you, you get um, more information, more learning about the processes, and hence can come up with both a better estimate and one that includes a lot more information that stakeholders and decision makers are increasingly interested in. Uh, next slide. So um, in reviewing all these approaches, it's clear that there are some structural and technical limitations of what's out there. There's obviously institutional structural um, barriers uh, where information that's being developed is highly distributed in many different places. From the decision maker's point of view, it can be a confusing uh, landscape of information and often uh, not intercompared, not standardized or harmonized. Each of the three approaches I referred to also have their own strengths and weaknesses. Atmospheric based, sorry, excuse me, activity based approaches have underlying activity data and emission factors. They might not be accurate, they might not be representative, they're often data collected by regulatory agencies that may not have uncertainty built in, things like that. Um, atmospheric based approaches might not be continuous, they may be spot measurements. Certainly, the transport model has errors associated with it that, that are well known. Um, and it's often difficult to get much both either granularity or separation of emissions into individual sectors or even subsectors of information. And then finally, hybrid approaches have their own suite of challenges. Um, digital technologies that are being utilized face challenges of interoperability, transparency, data quality, and algorithmic bias. So they all have some structural limitations. Next slide. Um, so in in, a, in building a framework to evaluate, the committee settled on um, a series of what we call pillars. And these were just, you know, almost uh, self-evident desirable qualities that you want in information that you're going to use in the decision-making space. And I'm gonna come back across these a couple of times. So I'll go through real quick right now. First, you want the information to be usable. That might be almost the most important of these attributes has to be usable by decision makers, by stakeholders for the purposes that they need that information for. It needs to be timely instead of the long latencies that we've seen in the past. It needs to be transparent. Um, it needs to be publicly available, traceable back to original data forms. Um, it needs to have evaluation and validation procedures so it's trusted um, comparison to other independent estimates is crucial. It needs to be complete. Um, cover all sources, all greenhouse gases for whatever rele relevant piece of geography you're, you're examining. It needs to be inclusive. Who's involved in the GHG information creation? Is that representative of the communities that might be impacted by it? And finally, it needs to be well communicated. It needs to show methods. It needs to be clearly communicated so that people from all different backgrounds can understand what the information is about. Next slide. So in, in building this uh, these pillars, we also started to just show an example of the evaluation framework when we look across those three broad approaches, just to start to set up the idea 
of this framework. And in each of these on the left, activity, atmospheric, and hybrid, the three that I reviewed, we broke this up into methods and data and gave some general outline of right now, given the status of what's out there across these three approaches or anticipated approaches in the case of hybrid, how they might score in a low, medium, high across the six pillars. And the point here is that, they, again, you see their strengths and weaknesses. Unfortunately, in some cases, they're complementary. One uh, approaches weaknesses, another one's strength, and vice versa. And so you can already begin to see that, that by integrating more, we'll overcome some of the weaknesses. Next slide. Sorry, and I'm just pointing out again that we demonstrated the use of this evaluation framework in a series of example use cases. I won't go through those here. We went through many in the report at multiple scales just to show how this framework might be applied to some of those examples to help uh, encourage the use and demonstrate the use of the evaluation framework that we built. Next slide. So ideally, in those six pillars, um, support the sort of this cycle where you develop a piece of uh, a greenhouse gas information inventory or an information suite um, that gets used in decision making processes of which we we um, identify three phases the sort of planning phase that is what you're going to mitigate who is that um, what sector what fuel how big how small um, tracking so once you start a mitigation policy um, tracking that over time so that you know if you're on or off course. And then finally, an assessment or, or verification of your mitigation policy. Did it meet its goals or did it miss them? And then finally, that feeds into um, identifying actions uh, that will mitigate. And then that can also, uh, once you learn a bit about using the information, feed back into adjusting or further tweaking the original greenhouse gas information that you use. Next slide. So I'm gonna go through a few of the final recommendations that came out of the report. Um, the first, again, just reiterates these pillars. And again, they're, they're crucial for building um, what we think is the best greenhouse gas information for the purposes of decision-making. Next slide. Um, we also recommended a rather practical outcome, which is something uh, like a clearinghouse or maybe a federation of clearinghouses, just because there are so many um, inventories, data sets, information systems that have been developed by many, many players, both within academia, the private sector, the NGO space, um, that there needs to be perhaps some place where they can be brought together. There, can be some harmonization comparison. And by doing that, you give um, stakeholders and, and decision makers a really good overview of what's out there in one location or federation of locations. Next slide. And this just goes through again, critical characteristics that need to be part of a clearinghouse. The information needs to be traceable, standardized data formats and metadata, something that people that build data repositories know all about good documentation and non-technical and multiple languages, um, evaluation metrics um, that evaluate each of these uh, data products, updated and accessible databases of the key input data so that you can trace the information back, governance mechanisms that are coordinated, trusted, and inclusive, and even education modules or, or videos that can help with capacity building so that more and more people can both use them and better understand them. And finally, collaborations with, with very parallel efforts that um, have lots of synergies and lots of co-benefits or trade-offs. And for example, collaborations with air quality information, um, which is crucial in a, at a lot of scales across the planet. Next slide. Transparency. Greenhouse gas information providers should clearly communicate underlying data, methods, and associated uncertainty. Everybody knows this is important. It's not always easy to do, but it's fundamental to, um, to building better greenhouse gas information. Next slide. Granularity and accuracy. Um, increasingly finer, both spatial scales and finer functional information is becoming important to decision makers. By functional, I mean things like not just numbers 
in a box or in a location, but what fuel, what sector, maybe what technology, um, other just useful bits of information that give decision makers not just a magnitude, but attributes that are very important about making particular decisions or engaging in particular policies. And the accuracy and representativeness of all the underlying data used to estimate emissions should be further improved. Next slide. Operationalization. Um, there's been a lot of development within the scientific and academic community on building um, all of those approaches that I showed to generate greenhouse gas information. And I think there's enough prototypes that um, the committee agreed that we're very close to operationalizing this, um, taking it out of laboratories, taking it out of individual maybe businesses or, um, or other entities and, and making some sort of operational system that has underlying support, is, is delivering information on in an ongoing updated basis with all of those attributes so that it can be used widely um, by stakeholders. That's not easy to do, but um, there's already lots of discussions here in the US about um, building more, something that's akin to an operational system for greenhouse gas information. The same is occurring in other parts of the world, particularly in Europe. Next slide. And then finally, this hybrid recommendation. It's clear that um, though the approaches have often been functioning in their own space, just um, sometimes out of necessity, sometimes out of complexity, um, but more and more it's clear that further integration of those approaches will lead to more uh, functional use, uh, better accuracy, um, availing of all the information that's available, and so the committee felt that encouraging more integration through this catch-all hybrid idea um, will really make a big difference. And also bringing in some of the newer um, digital techniques with machine learning, artificial intelligence that are being um, that are being built just in the very last few years um, that show a lot of promise. And that might be the end. Next slide. I think. Nope. Sorry. One more. Um, and then. It's clear that, sorry, thank you. Um, it's clear that in that cycle that that I described earlier, where you have all your different approaches, your your construction of information, um, having that used within these different phases of the decision making process, hitting your going after your policy goals and then iterating and then feeding that back into um, improved, uh, greenhouse gas into this cycle requires lots and lots of iteration. Um, it's not the type of thing that occurs through one cycle, that we have all learned a lot, both um, in building the technical systems to deliver this information, interacting with decision makers, and decision makers are also learning about the capacity as well. So, um, and that interaction just requires iteration, not only because it requires understanding between the, the two worlds, but they both evolve. And they'll, they'll co-evolve as they learn about the capacity of each other or better understanding of each other. So we strongly encourage this iterative cycle um, through development, decision-making policy goals, and, and back again. And that might be the last slide, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yes. So I'm going to close this session. I think I've left uh, a five minutes for questions, and I'm seeing one question that came in. So I'll see if I can respond to that. Activity-based estimations are averaged over longer time period. Atmospheric measurements use spot measurements. How does the hybrid approach recommended bridge the large difference in temporal scales and in spatial scales of these two approaches? Good question. I mean, I think that one possibility is that with something like an assimilation system, which is commonly to deployed in, let's say, weather forecasting with numerical weather prediction, those systems move through space and time, availing of, of observations whenever they come in. And so that can include spot measurements. It can include ongoing observational information. But the core is, is a model that will have you know physics, chemistry. It has processes. And so where you don't always have an observed quantity, you have a model that at least is hewing to those observational constraints when they are when when they occur, and so I think the following that model 
because um, again, using numerical weather prediction as an example, where we don't have observed quantities all the time, um, sometimes every three hours, sometimes six, sometimes only twice a day, um, the model has to fill in as it moves through space and time. And I imagine in these hybrid approaches, the same type of thing would ideally occur. Uh, one more question, given the need for more and better data, are there any particular industry sectors or processes that should be prioritized? Um, I think I'll, I'll give just my opinion and having done some of this work, I think that some of the biggest challenges probably come in the industrial sector only because um, it's a sector where there's probably less information available publicly for understandable reasons. But it's probably the sector that I think poses some of the biggest challenges in trying to estimate um, emissions uh, out of out of you know many different sectors. I think next are things like you know buildings dispersed sources are difficult both from an atmospheric observing perspective and from an activity based perspective. Um, that's difficult as well. Any other questions? Okay, well, I've bought us a couple minutes. I'm happy to close this session if there are no other questions. And um, turn it over to uh, to Don again, I think, to introduce the next session section. Very good. So, um... We're going to start the uh, what officially is session one, I guess. Uh, approaches for quantifying and reporting greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we'll have one hour in total uh, with three speakers, and then we'll have uh, about a half an hour for discussion afterwards. Uh, so we'll have a panel of experts who will share examples of approaches used in their work to quantify and report greenhouse gas emissions at the urban scale. Uh, each of the three speakers will have 10 minutes to provide their remarks. I will give a, a verbal two minute cue at eight minutes. Um, and once all the speakers are done, we will then have a larger group Q&A. Uh, so if you have a question, please submit your questions via Slido. So the first speaker is Kim Mueller. Uh, Kim is a member of the Greenhouse Gas Measurement Program at NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology where she focuses on characterizing urban and regional carbon dioxide and methane emissions. Kim, turn it over to you. Thanks, Don. Um, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm honored to be here today. And I wanted to thank the Academy staff and the committee members for inviting me to speak on how we here at NIST are using atmospheric observations um, to estimate urban to regional scale greenhouse gas emissions. And I'd like to know that NIST works in partnerships with um, many other federal and state agencies, the private sector, other academics and researchers. And we really don't try to go it alone. And instead, um, we levy the bevy of experience among these different communities. Um, so today I'm gonna to quickly explain who we are, what we do and can do and demonstrate um, capabilities and the value of estimating urban scale emissions. And before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge my fellow colleagues at NIST that are listed on this slide in orange. Next slide, please. So the National Institute of Standards and Technology is the US National Metrology Institute. And our mission is to promote US activities by advancing measurement science standards and technologies. So it's important to underscore that NIST is a non-regulatory agency and we are rooted in aiding commerce through standardization. Next slide, please. So as noted by Donna, I work in the Greenhouse Gas Measurement Program with, where our purpose, which is really not that surprising, aligns with the overall goal of NIST. So here we're, we look to using greenhouse gas measurement and methods to develop um, standards for mapping urban and regional greenhouse gas emissions. And what we're really looking towards is we want low latency information and that high granularity that Kevin talked about that can speak to a variety of stakeholder needs. We have several different components within our program, but today, um, just next slide, just the next tab, 
um, I'm going to forward uh, focus on the urban piece of our um, measurement program. Next slide. So before before I move forward, I'm going to use a different diagram than Kevin used in his slides um, to uh, explain and diagrammatically show um, how we use atmospheric measurements um, to infer greenhouse gases. So for the most part, first we observe the amount of greenhouses greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, like carbon dioxide and methane, that is their mass, although we do observe other constituents in the atmosphere. And we also take, as, as Kevin mentioned, a finely resolved, that is something that's very granular in space and time emissions information that is developed using uh, statistics like energy data from the EIA. And we also use this, another component that Kevin mentioned, which is this atmospheric transport model that um, simulates how sensitive observations are to the ground based on a bunch of meteorological parameters like wind direction and wind speed. It's a very important component. When we combine all this data together, and um, we like to call this the hybrid approach, it might be a little different than what Kevin mentioned, um, we estimate emissions. And I should note that these are territorial emissions. Next slide, please. And so, Although there are many parts of this system, um, some that are more important depending on the method people use, it, it generally comprises of two different components, one being the atmospheric measurements, and this is very important, tied to international standards, and a spatially explicit, oh, please go back to the previous slide. A space, previous slide. A spatially explicit um, emissions information. It, and our goals here are really to estimate urban emissions that are consistent, and that's really important, consistent from the urban to the continental scale. And we really want to get to that building and street level, uh, street level resolution in terms of our emissions with uncertainty goals at the whole city scale of one to 3%. And we're hoping, or we, this is our goal, is that this will lead to transparent methods and standardization that support policy and reporting. Next slide, please. So to this end, we've developed three urban test beds across the United States, one around Indianapolis, one in the Los Angeles megacity area, and the other, which is a regional test bed around in the northeastern part of the United States, which is focused on Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. And these are places, these are like mini laboratories that we can test different types of methods and measurements. But the backbone of our test beds are a dense set of permanent sites that consistently or um, continuously observe carbon dioxide and, and methane with a great amount of accuracy and precision. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I should note that some of our test beds are also uh, constrained by other types of observational um, platforms like aircraft measurements. And we can routinely make aircraft um, observations around Indianapolis and the Washington DC area. So now we can move on to some of the things we've learned with this particular study, where we're able to um, infer trends in whole city emissions around Washington DC and the Baltimore area shown in the red blobs in the, on the left-hand plot. So you can see in this, in this example where aircraft observate, observations led us to determine that there is a downward trend of carbon monoxide, which is closely related to carbon dioxide. And this wasn't really that unexpected to, unexpected to us because as we all know, fuel efficiencies are improving. But we are also able to detect um, or infer abrupt changes like the drop during the onset of behavioral changes associated with COVID-19. Next slide, please. Um, we are also able to infer these drops associated with COVID-19 across cities um, for carbon dioxide, in this case for the Washington DC and Baltimore area, along with Los Angeles. And using our permanent measurement sites, we did observe this oh, previous, can you go back to the previous slide please? Um, we were able to observe this relative decrease in emissions in April, 2020 compared to the other Aprils of previous years. And the drop was about 30 to 35%. Next slide, please. We're also able to infer whole city methane emissions and changes over time in the Baltimore and DC area and point to those sectors that contribute to these changes. In this case, we show a decreasing trend in methane over the past five years in Washington, DC and Baltimore. And we, previous slide, please. Um, 
and the estimated emissions correlate with the natural gas sector, which makes sense because our estimated emissions are higher in the winter than they are in the summer. And in the winter, we expect more people to use uh, natural gas to heat their homes. Other urban studies have published similar results like those of our colleagues in the Los Angeles region. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, but we can't talk about our science and move down to standardization space until we explore the stakeholder value of needing such information. So we've explored what our data means when we compare it to other pieces. And in this case, policy where the data is available. So we've compared estimates with those at the whole city scale. Uh, we've demonstrated how emissions correlated um, in terms of greenhouse gases to air pollutants at fine spatial scales where you can really get co-beneficial information or co-benefit um, impacts if you mitigate one or the other. And we've compared emissions to other, econ uh, other econ uh, economic drivers. Because you could imagine that policymakers want to know what types of policies that they can use compared to other things that may affect their emissions. And they need data to do that. So the next slide, please. Finally, I want to end on efforts across the US government to make finally resolved emission information that is aligned with air quality, um, with air quality data. And this, um, this effort is called the Greenhouse Gas and Air Pollutant Emission Systems for Grapes. And in the end, we hope it will help enable the hybrid approach that I explained earlier and that Kevin explained um, that will utilize atmospheric observations that will help us provide transparency and accuracy and precision of the, the data that, that a variety of stakeholders can use. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you. And I think I ended a little bit earlier than, which is great. Very good. So, Next uh, speaker, uh, so we'll, we'll go through all three speakers, is Yvonne Alvarez. And uh, Yvonne is a, uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, uh, is uh, a junior researcher affiliate with France's renowned Laboratory of Climate and Environmental Sciences. Her PhD research focuses on the intersection of urban climate politics and atmospheric monitoring. Yes, hello, and thank you for the introduction. I'm really thrilled to be here. I'd also, of course, like to thank the Academy to be invited and um, acknowledge my colleagues, especially to Malovo, um, for accompanying me uh, on a daily basis and for the valuable insights and help on that study. So uh, I will be talking to you about the short-term versus the long-term monitoring of urban GHG emissions to see how we can um, adapt with that. Next slide, please. So in Europe, we have that uh, project that's called ICA Cities. It's a, a project within the Green Deal. It started about 18 months ago. And it's one of the world's first coordinated networks that's bringing together um, 15 different cities from different um, from 15 European countries. And it concentrates on the testing of a comprehensive urban GHG measurement um, technique where it wants to provide actually um, data services that have a societal impact. So it's kind of comparable to what uh, Kim just mentioned in the urban um, test bed from NIST. And next slide, please. And here you can see a little more in detail one of the, the three uh, pilot cities that are in that project. Um, from left to right, you have Paris, Munich, and Zurich. And this is actually showing here uh, the setup of an atmospheric monitoring network if um, everything would be as a, science, a scientist would uh, wish for. So for example, in Munich, you can see it's really squared. But um, then we're actually facing reality um, while setting up that network because we don't get permission to set up anywhere. We want it to be where we see that it's best because the, um, the footprint is best or the sampling height is best or um, yeah, the influence area is best there, et cetera. But we're actually um, facing that we, in the end, rather have an opportunity-based uh, setup of a network. And uh, also what's uh, currently going on is that 
what we do take into account is current information, right? It's, it's what we have right now. We don't look into what's um, happening in the future, like urban sprawl or socioeconomic um, developments that are influencing future emissions. That's something that uh, we wanted to see. So what we try to see is what would future emissions look like in the future and what would an optimal network would look like if it takes into account such uh, information that are influencing um, future emissions. Next slide, please. So we first looked at the, um, the city self-reported inventories and uh, tried to see if they're on track to reaching their climate targets that they are mentioning. Then we, um, we try to have a look at the climate plans and see in how far are they actually influencing the spatial distribution of the future emissions. And then, and third, uh, we wanted to link that to the atmospheric monitoring networks and to see how far are they actually able to track those long-term emission trends that are really getting to a very um, fine scale. Next slide, please. So to answer that question, like I said, um, we looked at the cities have reported inventories. Here we have plotted um, the sectoral GHG emissions for Munich and um, Paris. Munich is in blue and Paris in red. I won't go too much into detail. We don't have time. What's interesting here is that we did see that the both cities are showing a decreasing trend in their GHG emissions. But however, on the right hand side, you can see the, the two flashes in um, in blue and in red, that are actually showing the gaps that are in between um, the city's climate targets and where they are heading for if they continue the efforts that they are mentioning in the climate plans. So yes, they do have a decreasing trend, but it's not enough in order to reach the climate targets, for example, um, climate neutrality by 2050, for example, um, for Paris. Next slide, please. So what we wanted to see is also um, what Kevin has mentioned before, the validation is very important. Um, we wanted to see if it's really true what they're um, saying, um, they're decreasing trends since it's self-reported inventories and they do have a certain amount of um, uncertainty. So I have uh, this uh, colleague, um, Jingui Lian, she ran an inversion for six years um, over the Paris area. And it did uh, confirm or validate the decreasing trend of um, the self-reported emission inventories. And um, so we, um, we were comfortable with uh, using um, that information. Now the question is, how will emissions evolve in the future? Next slide, please. So here I'm showing you a very simplified way um, what we did in order to see what emissions would look like in the future. So first step is to, um, Oops. that we, <laughs> our problem. It, so the, I will just continue then. Um, the first step is that we uh, took the um, emissions inventories that uh, are coming from the city or <laughs> wherever, which we take as a baseline. Then in the second step, um, what do you want me to, to stop? <laughs> I don't know what happened. I don't see the slides anymore. No, we don't either. There yes. we go. <laughs> so like I said, so the first step is to have the baseline, right? And, and spatialized emission inventory. And the second step, we take a look at the um, climate action plan that the studies are um, issuing. So there we try to quantify all the action items in order to mitigate the, the C2 emissions that are mentioned in that climate plan. That takes that taken, we subtract them from the baseline in order to have then the projected um, emission maps for each sector for it, we took 2030 and 2050 in a spatialized way. Um, yeah. Next slide, please. So it much more looks like this. Um, don't worry, um, I will go uh, through each one of the steps uh, with you. Next slide, please. So first step, like I said, have a baseline and emission inventory. We had the chance that uh, the French startup Origins Earth had prov uh, provided us with a high resolution dynamic inventory. This is built on a massive amount of um, data, which is actually then um, combined 
with uh, several um, proxies, uh, a lot of um, yeah different activities that really give us a um, oh yeah, and then of course a uh, uh, data about the dynamization, like for example, the energy usages, which which give us a temporal profile, and then we mix this all together, which give us a very uh, detailed information for every sector, for every um, um, neighborhood, and also on a temporal scale, we, we can go um, through to the hourly level. Um, this is rather comparable to um, the Vulcan or the Hestia emissions product that you might already know um, from the S. Next slide, please. This is what it would look like for... Next slide. Yeah, this is what uh, this high resolution dynamic inventory looks like for France for one year on a two, two meter um, scale. Next slide. Two minutes left. Thank you. Um, so here you can see the same uh, information, but um, the, as time series. So it's from 2018 to 2022 for the greater metropolitan area of Paris and uh, for every emission sector. And this really gives us the opportunity to have a close look um, at special events like uh, the COVID lockdown, energy crisis, and also having the Parisians, so uh, we can see the Parisians leaving um, for the summer holidays where traffic emissions are really going um, lower. And then also on the bottom level, you can see the annual emissions, where it's interesting to see that the 2022 um, annual GHG emissions are actually lower than the 2020 ones, which indicates that the um, energy crisis uh, due to the Ukraine war is actually influencing much more emissions than had uh, the COVID crisis. Which is rather interesting to see. Next slide, please. So after that first step of building the emission inventory, you had a closer look at the, um, at the climate plans. Since in Paris, uh, the building sector and the traffic sector are um, comprising about 80% of uh, all the whole um, city emissions. We concentrated on those sectors. So you can see a small uh, view of the residential sector. In the climate plan in Paris, they want, they mentioning, for example, that they want to renovate 45,000 dwellings per year. And uh, so I mapped here, uh, where are those uh, high energy consuming buildings and as you can see, it's really in the, in the city center with some of the surrounding areas. And if we zoom into that black area, then we see that there's a really high correlation between um, the CO2 emissions, the building's age, and the share of all that is used uh, for the heating. So what's interesting is here that they are concentrating in their climate plan actually on um, energy efficiency and not on GHG emissions, although the the final goal is actually to have climate neutrality so they have a GHG emissions at uh, zero. Next slide, please. For the traffic sector, um, kind of the same, they're concentrating on air quality factors. And here they advocate the willingness to ban fuel powered cars by the year 2030. So no more fuel powered cars are allowed in that uh, reddish area on the left-hand side. And this is why, you can see on the right hand side the uh, drop in emissions it's really concentrated only in that area which actually really shows that uh, it's very important to have a uh, interregional collaboration instead of having only focused on your own city and uh, not look uh, anywhere else you we really, really need thank you um so we really need to have that uh, coherent picture next slide please so here you have the uh, total emissions for Paris. What's interesting here is really the spatial um, heterogeneity that's observable at that very fine scale, which is important for the dimensioning of um, an optimal atmospheric monitoring network for the future. Next slide, please. And so the take home messages are really that uh, the cities, like I said, are heading in the right direction, but still are a little too slow. Um, you have that spatial heterogeneity and uh, future urban networks really need to consider future uh, GHG emissions and not only urban um, expansions. 
Thank you. Yeah. Next slide, you can show the last slide. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Ron Cohen from uh, the Atmospheric Chemistry Department at the uh, what is it? Atmospheric Chemistry Expert at the University of California, Berkeley. And he's also the Chief Scientist at Secured Carbon, a company aiming to provide financing for projects coupled to verified greenhouse gas emission reductions. Ron? Thank you, Don, and uh, thank you all for coming to hear from us today. Um, so I, I wanna reinforce the points you heard in uh, the previous two speakers and from uh, Kevin in his overview of this report, that uh, providing uh, detailed information about greenhouse gas emissions in cities is possible and also urgent. Um, and I'll, I'll offer some opinions from my own work um, in the context of trying to build, uh, as Kevin described, a hybrid approach. So in the next slide. So just to repeat that, uh, we really do have the tools to instrument and report out in greenhouse gases in every US city. Um, in this uh, day one policy memo, we made an argument that you could, uh, every city over 100,000 people could uh, have uh, greenhouse gas emissions reporting. Um, it's important that we do this with an eye to environmental justice. Many of the public issues related to exposure to air pollutants are associated with uh, where we have large greenhouse gas emitters and we should be paying close attention to the intersection of these two important objectives related to climate and public health. And uh, We've been talking about cities, uh, but as you just saw in, at the end of Yvonne's talk, the way cities are gonna reduce their emissions is with individual projects at, indi at individual buildings. Um, and those projects need to be financed. Um, and so we should be aspiring, not just to whole cities, but to verification of the emission reductions of specific projects. And that sort of verification would enable the creation of financial instruments that would accelerate uh, the goals that we have of reducing greenhouse gases. Next slide. So uh, again, we're gonna pursue a hybrid approach. The uh, instrument that we've built is called Beacon, uh, the Berkeley Environment, Air Quality and CO2 Network. Uh, and as you've heard from everyone before me, you, you have some sort of uh, an in emission inventory which includes all the different sources of greenhouse gas emissions. The one on the left here is a CO2 inventory. Uh, and you see the roads and you see individual point sources. And then we have a set of observations and those green dots show where we're making measurements in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and then you have a synthesis and analysis showing uh, how that combination of an inventory and observations tells you something about the the emissions and something that's different from your inventory. And here you can see a series of four Aprils. The, the white is, the, is our prior, our, our guess, and the colored bars are the difference from that guess in each of the four Aprils. Next slide, please. So the, it's important to, um, as, as you heard in the previous speakers, it's important to be able to disentangle the different sectors of emissions. So here's an example of four sectors for the San Francisco Bay Area. There's an industrial sector that has, uh, is about a third of the total emissions, but comes in small, you know, geographically isolated point sources. The passenger vehicles, which are uh, distributed along the roads primarily, but also going to and from people's homes. The residential heating, as you just saw, it's so important in the Paris example. And then the diesel trucks, which are, are largely on the same places as the passenger vehicles, but have a very different mix of pollutants and a very different imp impact on public health. Next slide, please. So the, the way we've been going about this is to uh, put together an observing system. The observing system uh, has uh, hardware costs, which uh, tend to be what's eye-catching. 
uh, but it's, you know, as with most things we do, it's really the people to maintain and interpret that drives the true price of it. So uh, you'll, you'll hear lots of things about low cost sensing. Uh, really, you should be paying attention to the number of people involved in interpreting those measurements. And if, if you're, we're not driving down the number of people involved, then it, it, you're not really changing the costs because the hardware costs don't really drive what we do. So in this case, the initial hardware costs for a, a network that's based on about a mile covering a city is somewhere, but depending on the area of the city you're thinking about is hardware costs of between two and four person years. And then ongoing analysis and maintenance uh, would have uh, significant economies of scale if we were thinking about many cities. So you would have less than a person per city per year on average. Uh, next slide, please. Um, actually, if you could go back for one second. Uh, I just wanna emphasize that um, one of the things that's unique about the beacon approach is that we're measuring CO2, but also the air quality gases, CO, ozone, NO, and NO2, and PM2.5 in every location. So we bring, um, you heard a little at the end of Kim's talk about grapes. We're uh, trying to drive this synthesis of air quality and CO2. Uh, uh, the, the two communities, the greenhouse gas community and the air quality community have been proceeding in parallel where learning from one community doesn't translate to learning from the other community. And that's really a tremendous waste of effort. And so uh, bringing the two together fundamentally at their original inventory and with observations can really uh, be a hidden cost savings and a hidden efficiency in, in everything we do together. Next slide, please. So uh, we've been uh, exploring this model. Uh, be the beacon idea is being uh, implemented in four urban centers. You see here in the Bay Area, in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, uh, with uh, in collaboration with Meredith Hastings at Brown, in Los Angeles, in collaboration with Will Berylson at USC, and in Glasgow, Scotland, in collaboration with Craig Mickey at the University of Strathclyde. And so we have the identical hardware and identical calibration approaches and software, but different people trying to think about each of their cities differently, all trying to see if we can uh, build a a community together that could advance the utility and ease of use of this idea. Next slide, please. Um, and again, we're, we're unique in the simultaneous emphasis on greenhouse gases and air quality. Uh, in everything we do, we're making all those measurements together. Here's just an example of one time series showing, and you can see, a, you know, about seven days in, you see a spike in NO that doesn't show up in any of the other traces and you, where in other places you see strong correlation, for example, between CO and CO2. Most of the carbon monoxide comes from cars and a tremendous amount of the daily variation in CO2 is also from cars, for example. Next slide, please. So in addition to their separate importance for air quality, the air quality gases provide a very important route to attribution of the CO2. So here's just one example of that. You see the passenger vehicles have much, much higher carbon monoxide per unit CO2 emission than industrial emissions, diesel trucks, or residential heating. So uh, by a sim simultaneous use of the different kinds of information from the air quality gases, you it's can have much before. finer attribution. In the next slide, please. So I'll just show you an example. You already saw some uh, of this, um, the, the COVID period. So here you see in blue uh, what CO2 or CO looked like before the COVID related shutdown and in orange afterward. Uh, and two things happened. One, uh, we all stayed home and two, spring came. And so it's important to disentangle the effects of springtime from the effects of the shelter in place. So next slide. So here's an example of the, an inverse, uh, just as described by my colleagues, uh, a weather model that combined a, a prior and our ob observations to get an estimate. And here it is disentangled by sector. 
So you see that on average before the shelter in place, we, our emissions were about 400 tons uh, of carbon per hour. And then after that shelter in place, they were almost always less than that 400 tons shown in that red line and that the big change was in the traffic. But you also see that the, in the green that uh, the trees were more active and so carbon was being removed from the system more by the, the biosphere than earlier. Next slide, please. Uh, if you go back just one, uh, here we have for carbon monoxide, uh, you see again that the, um, the emissions dropped. They dropped especially at night um, and, and from the traffic sector. Next slide, please. So, uh, um, so I just want to emphasize this point that air quality and greenhouse gases have much in common and that uh, we could be much more efficient if we bring these two things together. So I'm excited to see this new effort called GRAPES that uh, Kim told you about at the end of her talk. And the next slide, please. So uh, yeah, I'll be done in just a second. So I already showed you uh, that we can track emissions within a month. Uh, and we can also track uh, process level things. So I show you in this uh, other figure here that um, the fuel efficiency of the average vehicle has improved by about 3.3% per year over time. And that, that's another thing, kind of thing we can get from these uh, observations and inventories. And then the next slide. So yeah, to, to close out here, um, I just wanna say that, that, you know, that really the important thing is the people. So I show you here an example of three of my close collaborators in establishing this project. Alexis Schusterman, who was a grad student who worked on me, this with me in the early days. Alex Turner, who did much of the development of our modeling strategy. And Naomi Asimo, who's working on the CO2 uh, trends right now. Um, we're, we're on a steep trajectory as a community learning how to do this, uh, but we're in a position to uh, deliver greenhouse gas and air quality information in every city uh, in a cost-effective and sustainable way. So thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Ron. And um, now we'll go into the uh, uh, Q&A. Um, you know, please do ask your questions on Slido. Uh, meanwhile, I'll ask a couple of questions um, to our speakers. Uh, first of all, I, I was really curious what kind of response policymakers are giving you uh, relative to the work you're doing. Why don't, why don't I start? Um, I'd say policymakers are focused on the UN prescription. So in my initial conversations with policymakers, the idea that we're bringing measurements to the table uh, is not yet um, a, of deep interest because uh, they think their instructions are to uh, fill out a spreadsheet per the UN. And their, their, their recommendation to me was that I should go to the UN and try and change the UN prescription. I, I think the kinds of things you heard from the three of us uh, should pretty rapidly change that, that the existence of the possibility of uh, using observations to show that inventories are changing in the ways that cities expect or not changing in the way that cities expect um, should, should bring things to a different point uh, with those policymakers. But I think cities are short staffed and they're struggling to, and so their idea that we would bring new, new tools to them is not yet yet socialized. I, I think that's largely true. I think the city of Chicago may be an exception because I think they would be. I just wanted to know that um, <clears throat> at least, uh, you know, we we try to interface with pol policymakers um, partially because we want to know how our data is, is useful. But um, I also wanted to know that unless you're at the state level, at, at the city level, a lot of the city policies are voluntary. So I think that that um, I don't think that means they're not I mean, I, I can't speak about their policies, but I could say that 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 may have an impact in terms of how much engagement people have. Um, and then until we see some things that are more, more um, not voluntary, there might be more engagement. <clears throat> 
Okay. Yvonne, did you have something? Yeah. Well, I'm working very closely with the city of Paris. Um, they're very much interested in our work and the project that I presented, Ica Cities, is actually looking at what cities need, what they want, and what can they include into their um, policies. And what we do see is that although they are very interested and we have a very um, yeah, common uh, get together, we exchange on a, on a regular basis, it is really hard to get things um, in a written um, phase uh, into the policies. It's really, right now, it's more about, let's say like, get to know each other, how do you work? What can we do? What can we get from you? But really to have it down to policy making, to trigger it down, this is really um, difficult right now though. So yeah, they are interested and I think we will get there, but it does take some time also to, to speak the same language. Um, there are a couple of things that we need to overcome still. We're get, starting to get some questions from uh, the audience, but uh, one more quick question uh, before we do that. Uh, I wonder if you could just talk, and I know Ron already kind of dealt with this, but could you talk a little bit more about how the tools and methods you used in your work could be applied more broadly to other cities? I I, I guess I could make a, a plug from one of my colleagues who uses aircraft observations. Um, I showed a little bit of his work um, I think that beyond the sensors that Ron uses and some of the, you know, tall, permanent in situ sites that we talk about a lot and some of the, you know, the variety of different things, I think aircrafts or measurements could be used more often um, if they're used on a routine basis. I think they can provide a lot of, um, a lot of value. Anybody else? I, I think, you know, just to reiterate what I said, I think uh, we have some pretty good ideas for how to do this at scale. Uh, there's a lot of commonality in what the ICOS U European cities are trying and what we're trying and what the four, the four cities and the test beds, of, the NIST test beds are trying. Um, and so uh, I think any one of those approaches is um, primarily people driven. And so we could um, we could choose a set of hardware and move forward, uh, really trying to figure out how to, what the what the cost savings are at scale, which is really where the some of the interesting challenges will be and the interesting opportunities that the that the ability to do this in multiple cities at once and really learn from the different uh, plan forms of different cities how to how to be effective would accelerate. What we're all trying to accomplish tremendously. Yeah, I think we're from the technological aspect. I think we're there. We can do that. We can expand. We can scale it. What we need is, um, as Kevin and also Kim have already said, we need this coordinated approach. We need some kind of standards that really make sure that the data that we provide are comparable and that also the cities between one and another can compare themselves to, in order to see where do we actually stand compared to a city that is comparable to mine. But I should just caution to say that there are some things that do not necessarily work yet that are in research and development. For example, if we think that satellites are going to be able to be able to provide city scale information and any time in the in the very near term, I think that that is is really getting yourself over the wheels of the bicycle. I just it's going to be a long time before that type of um, you know satellites are going to be able to provide that type of information in the short, at least in the intermediate term. No, that's a good point. So uh, we have a question for Ron. Uh, do sensors at one mile intervals in Beacon sufficiently identify industrial point sources? So I think the answer for that is depends on the scale of those industrial point sources. 
um, for industrial point sources that are large compared to the emissions from other things in that grid cell? The answer is yes. And for, um, for things that are at the same scale of uh, the emissions in their grid cell, uh, I think it should be yes, but we have yet to demonstrate that. So we have a question for Yvonne. Um, really interesting to see the level of detail and connection to the climate plans. Is there feedback where policymakers are updating policy based on what you are finding? Sort of answered that already. This, yeah, I would hope for that. That's uh, actually what really drives my research to have it uh, applied into uh, reality and see it uh, become yeah, something living. Um, right now, like I said, we are in that exchange phase uh, with Paris and also with Munich. We had uh, several exchanges with the policymakers, and um, but it's not always uh, the technical people who are interested in what we are providing and who understand what we are providing that are actually pushing through the the policy makings. So. There is also inside the, the city administration that they need to get aligned with one another. And, and then, yeah, of course, I would just hope for that, that those findings get to push their way through. So I, I'd just like to add that it's, it's easy to get drawn to the policymakers because they're individual decision makers with authority over a whole city in, in concept. But a lot of the change that we're going to try and drive will be driven by individual decision makers and smaller projects. Yeah. And our ability to connect to the finance community. And um, you know, there's a ton of energy in so-called green bonds. And the idea that um, those bonds could be verified is, is a really interesting one that might change things. So I, you know, I you know, full disclosure, I joined this small startup that's trying to sell those things. But I, I did that because it was the first place that where I felt like my science could really contribute to, to change in a way that was fundamentally different than uh, other folks who were trying to convince me to join their small companies. Yeah, I'm trying to do the same thing with um, uh, the company I'm part of, uh, Earth, Earth's Knowledge, Earth Knowledge. And uh, in which we're trying to work extensively with uh, corporations and uh, help them deal with these issues. Um, so we have uh, uh, the next question actually is again for Ron, how do we access, uh, how, do, how do we get access to land to put the sensors? Does that limit where you can put them? High rise building owners might not let you have the space to place the sensors. Well, that's you the data. Um, so that is, of course, one of the challenges. Uh, we've been proceeding uh, by working with uh, large distributed landowners. Uh, the most convenient uh, for us has been uh, local school districts. So almost all of our sensors are on top of a school. Uh, we can make a deal with those folks, uh, both that will come into their classroom and give them materials and develop materials at scale that could be used by teachers to talk about the measurements that are occurring on the roof of their building. Uh, but also a school dish, you can make an arrangement with a school district and then get access to 15 or 20 sites all from one landowner. Um, and that greatly reduces the overhead of that part of the project. Other building by building, it's extremely difficult. Everyone has their own set of legal requirements and tricks. Um, and so we, we try very much not to do things building by building, but by agreements with a large landowner. I, I just wanted to piggyback on what Ron said, because that's true for any in-situ site. It doesn't have to be a low-cost sensor. The, like I said, the backbone of our test beds are high-precision Picaros, and um, finding places to put those is very, very challenging. Um, and so I don't, I think that that's a logistical hurdle that anyone is going to have to, to, you know, jump through. And that's why things that are 
you can observe from space or air on these mobile platforms are, are very attractive because you don't have to look for the leases. You don't have to look for those locations and deal with those nitty gritties. Um, so um, there are certainly more than just the aircraft I mentioned. That's why satellites are interest. People are interested in satellites, drones, you know, other type of high hyperspectral um, instruments. Um, partially because of this logistical issue of how do you site and fund and deal with the legal requirements of site or having a permanent sensor. Yeah. Then you deal with timing issues with the fact one's continuous. And the other right. Isn't. Exactly. There's these trade-offs you have to make. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, another question for Yvonne. Uh, can you shortly explain the calculation basis and information sources you use for converting a 3% year renovation plan into energy reduction and then into greenhouse gas emission reduction? Sure, um, well, in a short way. Um, <laughs> Very short. So way. yeah, uh, the 3% that are actually um, what's written in the climate plan. So uh, I was a little quick on that part maybe. Um, so that's saying that uh, they have 45,000 dwellings that they want to renovate and that's 3% uh, of the overall um, dwelling budget, let's say. So that corresponds to that. And then uh, what I've done is uh, that I took the most energy um, used, uh, that the dwellings that are the high uh, energy uh, consumers, so the biggest ones in, in France, we actually have labels for each one of them. So I took the words and um, I simulated what would it be if we renovated them and had them at instead of a 330 uh, kilowatt hour square, per square meter per year uh, energy consumption, I uh, renovated them and uh, had them afterwards in a uh, 50 um, kilowatt hour energy consumption per square meter per year. So a really high uh, impact on, on, on energy consumption, as you can see. And then uh, based on what they are using as fuel types, so I did not change that. I just renovated like, for example, from simple glazed to, to triple glazed windows, stuff like that, or the roofs. Um, so I took the same uh, energy used for heating, and then I translated that uh, simply through the emissions factor, and then um, got back to my um, GHG emissions. So this is how, how the approach uh, basically uh, is done. Okay, we have a question for Kim. The WMO prescribes concurrent air quality and greenhouse gas analyses and measurements. At the US federal level, how can we truly develop and implement such systems of monitoring, reporting, and verification nationally? For example, phone weather apps now report uh, air quality. When will they do that for CO and CO2? Mm, that's a really good question. I can't answer that question with a with a, a good air bar, but I can say that we recognize this need that Ron. Um, rightly articulated in his presentation that doing these two things in parallel in silos um, doesn't make any sense. And that's why this, um, this, uh, the initi this initiative called GRAPES came into being just recently of trying to, to bring that information together. Once that information, once we move forward with that, and and that that information is available, I suspect that there will be data providers that will be able to take that information and do things like make apps or package it in a way that is like a lot of the weather apps are able to do today. But um, I think we, I think the first step is to acknowledge it. We have, you know, I just mentioned NIST and NOAA as being a part of this, but we've recently had some discussions across many different agencies, NASA, um, other parts of NOAA, uh, DOE. I know I'm leaving, leaving some agencies out, so I apologize to those folks. So there's a lot of interest to do this across the federal landscape. And I think that that's a real positive step forward. And I think we're all excited to work towards that end goal. Very good. I, I was just part of a report to NOAA that uh, basically suggested that they get on to exactly that, that kind of thing. So um, so there's a lot of interest out there. Um, 
So we had a question for Ron uh, from a Bay Area resident uh, who's interested in his thoughts on how his work is being integrated into the San Francisco Climate Action Plan. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd say that at this moment, our work is not, we're responding to that climate action plan by trying to observe whether things are changing as predicted by it, but we're not driving the climate action plan. Um, and so we, you know, with, with the comfort level we have now and our ability to observe things, we're um, looking forward to a closer collaboration with our local colleagues in uh, developing plans that can be ver verified and demonstrated and, um, and adjusting those plans when things don't go as expected, which of course will happen. Okay. Uh, so we have a question for Yvonne. Uh, were the presented data sets where residential emissions were shown to be higher than commercial due to the lack of reporting from the commercial sector, utilities, um, oops, I just lost where I was at, usage, uh, commercial, or utilities, usage, commercial real estate? Um, no, I could not say that uh, the residential sector has less, uh, has more uh, detailed information on emissions than the tertiary sector has. They are both uh, um, influenced uh, by, by gas consumptions, by stuff like that. Um, we do have what I was just explaining, those uh, energy labels um, for the residential sector that is not being done for the tertiary sector, but this is not, um, something that's really influencing um, a detailed uh, question about the, the emissions. So um, no, the question was, why is it in the end uh, lower? I guess that's the, really uh, the reality and that uh, a lack of uh, emissions that are reported in our inventory. Okay. Uh, Kim, um, I have a question for you. What is the scale for air platform measurements? Do these measurements provide more granular data than ground-based sensors at one mile intervals? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I just want to reiterate that along with Kevin and others here that it's really a system. So um, when we use aircraft observations, we use this, we try to use it with as, as a spatially explicit, I don't want to say prior, that's very much a a cottage term in our industry, but emissions information. Um, and then we try to see how the atmospheric observations inform that uh, spatially explicit and temporally explicit emissions information. And I think that that depends, the, the, question, the answer to that question depends on how good that coupled system really is. Um, Generally, if you use something like aircraft observations, I think if you even if you didn't use something spatially explicit, you still could get to whole city emissions. You wouldn't be able to get to that detailed level of information. However, the high, you know, people like Carbon Mapper, which is a private company, um, <clears throat> they're able to use hyperspectral imaging to be able to get down to plumes and point sources um, for methane. And so I think. It really depends on what you're what you're going for, and using the right measurement and techniques to try to to you know to constrain the emissions that you're you know that that you're interested in. Oh, sorry, Kevin just mentioned Carbon Mapper is a nonprofit. Thank you for correcting me, Kevin. Yes. Okay. Um, I had another question for Ron, um, and I've kind of seen this myself in the observations that are being made uh, by Argon uh, in Chicago area. Um, uh, how does the air quality data you collect compare to the EPA uh, network, air quality network? Uh, what air quality events do you capture and what are, you, what are missed with low cost sensors? Are the low cost air quality sensors more precise and accurate than low cost greenhouse gas sensors? Um, okay, so I would say that the, in general, we're not, we're seeing the same things as the regulatory network and the air quality side, and we're, uh, we're seeing it with uh, more spatial granularity. So we see differences in different locations. 
um, the sensors are not as precise as the higher cost ones that are the EPA regulatory standard, uh, but they're, um, they can be just as accurate. Um, in terms of the, you know, the, what you should be thinking about in terms of the precision and accuracy is the, the relative accuracy needed to be useful. So for CO2, you're not particularly useful unless you're good to about a part in 400 or better. Whereas for NO2 or ozone, if you're good to, you know, five or ten percent, you're you're contributing, especially if you have 50 locations and the square root of n is your advantage. And you, um, so it, the the two kinds of needs uh, drive different sensor requirements to be useful, um, but the the low cost sensors in, in both cases are uh, capable of the kind of accuracy and precision that uh, can. Uh, provide a useful map and those maps can be interpreted in a useful way. Very good. Okay, so we're gonna close the session. Before we do that, um, we're gonna give a chance, uh, first of all, to thank each of the speakers, but also to ask each of the speaker for a closing thought. Who wants to go first? Go ahead, Kim. Oh, great. I was going to just say, go ahead, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> well, from being from NIST, I'm just going to have to push for this idea of moving toward, I didn't really make it in the question and answer portion of the talk, but I think what's really needed is standard us to move towards standardization. And without that type of stand, without moving towards standardization, um, I think it's going to still be sort of a, a little bit of a wild west out there in terms of um, in terms of of you know how reliable you think that your estimates are. You have to are going to always have to kind of eval keep evaluating it. And so we're really focused on that and interested in taking the science and moving it along into the standardization process. So I'm gonna to have to wave our flag to say that, you know, this is what we're about and we're we're excited about moving this forward. So I'll add that uh, completely concurring with what Kim said, we're excited to partner with her and the rest of our NIST colleagues in reaching some standardization. I just I refer back to the pillars of this report that Kevin highlighted in his opening. Um, we're committed to open data. If you go to our website, the data can all be downloaded. Uh, and, and it's you can ask us for the raw, raw form and the calibrated form is open to anyone without asking. Um, and I'd say the other thing that we didn't emphasize, but that is true for all of these approaches is we've established a pretty timely uh, systems of analysis. So you can get uh, an analysis of the greenhouse gas emissions for a city within three months of when those emissions happen, you know, maybe sooner. And so the, the kinds of lags that uh, we struggle with and other kinds of reporting in the greenhouse gas systems are, can be um, eliminated uh, using direct observations in this hybrid approach. Okay, Yvonne? Yeah, I can just say that I totally agree with the two. Um, for me, it's really important to have, like I said already, uh, those standards in order to have something comparable. And uh, I did not go too much into detail in my um, presentation, but what we're actually using um, that the company is using Origins Earth is a hybrid approach as well. And I really think that's the, where we should be going because we have those two approaches and they're very much complementary. We can learn from the two of them. They're um, both having their advantages, of course, also their disadvantages. But I think uh, picking the best of each one of them and then trying to get them to work together is really where, um, yeah, we should be going. And uh, for friends, at least we're at the building scare on an hourly basis, we can have uh, the emission inventory from last month. So we are really, um, yeah, capable of, of telling um, policymakers that to see if they're going in the right direction or not. And 
to guide them also um, to see where they can be uh, doing better maybe in next year or over the, the future. So I think that uh, is really something, this work together also with the policymakers is really interesting and important. Well, I want to thank you all. Uh, that was an um, excellent session. Um, we'll take a break now for 30 minutes uh, before we go into the afternoon sessions. Uh, so, um, so it's 12.30 Eastern time. Uh, uh, so we'll start again at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern time uh, with the next session. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back from our break. My name is Anne-Marie Eldring, and I will be moderating our next session. I'm a scientist at NIST working in the Greenhouse Gas Measurement Group. And session number two is about urban stakeholder information needs for decision making. Um, and we've got a great selection of uh, folks for our panel here today. They'll be doing some introduction of themselves, but just in contrast to the previous panel, if you were here, uh, the folks that are in this session are more focused on actual policy making in the art of decision making, et cetera. So a little different uh, perspective to share. And the way we're going to run this session is, is an entirely a moderated discussion. Um, we're going to let folks introduce themselves and then uh, start them off with some questions. And I very strongly encourage our audience to help us out and submit your questions in Slido. Uh, you can upvote questions so we can uh, see what it is people really want to hear the discussion be about. So really, please engage, uh, ask questions and That'll help us make the most of the opportunity to have for this discussion today. And I understand we have a pretty big audience out there, so we want to uh, hear what you're interested in. All right, I'll stop talking and let our um, panel introduce themselves. We'll just go through folks in the order here with Phil, Robert, Michael Berger, Mike Ogletree. Uh, let you introduce yourselves and then kick off to some questions. Thank you. I guess I'll start. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Philip Klein. I'm the executive officer at the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. Uh, that is the uh, regional air quality agency in the San Francisco Bay Area covering about nine counties. Uh, I've only been in the job for a little over two months. Uh, prior to that, I was working in DC uh, at EPA as a principal deputy associate Administrator for policy uh, as a political appointee for two years, coming in with the Biden administration. Prior to that, I was at uh, the South Coast version, the Southern California version of the Bay Area AQMD, the South Coast AQMD, for almost 15 years, working on a variety of technical and policy areas. And as Anne Marie knows, prior to that, I was in academia doing research. So I have been on um, sort of both sides of this equation, doing research that is designed to feed uh, policymakers and help in that decision making, but also being on the receiving side. So maybe that brings a unique perspective. Uh, the Bay Area AQMD is, a, is again, a local air agency traditionally focused on criteria pollutants and air toxics and protecting uh, folks from the, the negative health effects of air pollution. More recently, last five to 10 years, uh, like many uh, local air districts and states have been focusing more on greenhouse gases, both because of the, the enormity of the problem, but also uh, because of all the uh, there's a lot of synergies between and policies between greenhouse gas reductions as well as uh, reducing air pollution and protecting public health, uh, and also the, the the crossover between the fact that our air quality, despite emissions being reduced in terms of traditional air pollution, uh, because of uh, higher temperatures, because of events like um, uh, uh, wildfires, our air quality is not improving as fast as we had, would like. So we have a vested interest in making sure that we uh, uh, minimize the effects of, of climate change in order to do our core mission. I look forward to the discussion and uh, answering any questions. Thanks, Anne Marie. Great. Thank you, Phil. Robert, will you go ahead and introduce yourself for us? Hi there. Uh, Robert Stipka, I'm head of climate action. Uh, implementation for the North American region of C40 cities. Uh, I sit here actually in Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada, so coming north of the border, but I work with our 17 uh, C40 cities in Canada and the United States. Uh, C40 is a global uh, collaboration of 
uh, climate mayors who are committed to achieving the Paris targets and to be part of C40, um, cities need to achieve five of our leadership standards. Um, and you know, among the leadership standards are uh, having GPC compliant emissions inventories um, updated every two years and Paris compliant climate action plans. And so certainly those come in hand in hand. Uh, another area that we're working on is consumption-based emissions inventories as well and, emission, and, and action on consumption-based emissions. And so we're very look closely looking at, you know, not only what are the emissions actually uh, sourced from within cities, but also um, what, are the, what are the emissions as a result of activities that happened within cities? And I think there's a variation there in terms of what we are uh, measuring. Uh, prior to my stint at, at C40, which I've been here for one year, um, I worked for uh, the, the local uh, energy company here in British Columbia, supported cities in partnerships around implementing, um, supporting their climate action plans, as well as implementing performance-based building codes. And prior to that, uh, quite a bit of consulting with cities and supporting their climate action inventories and plans. So I look forward to the discussion. Excellent. Thanks, Robert. So glad to have you here. Mike Berger, let us uh, hear a little bit about you. Sure. Uh, thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, so my name is Mike Berger. I'm the executive director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School. The Sabin Center is a think and do ha uh, think and do tank that's housed at the law school and does the sorts of things that you would expect go along with that um, across a wide range of climate change issues on the mitigation and adaptation fronts up and down the scales of government from the local to the global. Um, one of our initiatives is our city's climate law initiative, um, uh, through which we not only conduct independent research and um, promote what we hope is thought leadership in the field, um, but also engage directly with cities, cohorts of cities, um, and sort of um, organizations and associations like C40 and others uh, that sort of work with cities uh, to, to address their climate commitments. The purpose of the city's climate law initiative was to, we set it up to fill a gap in the provision of sort of legal expertise to cities that have made um, ambitious climate commitments, 80 by 50, net zero, 100% um, clean energy, what, whatever it may be, and to address the, the naughty legal issues that come up when pursuing those policies, um, some of which are not necessarily fully considered um, at the time that the that the policy the commitments are are made, that's not our only engagement in cities. We also um, have over a number of years. I actually started my career as an environmental and land use attorney uh, for the city of New York under uh, Mike Bloomberg's mayoral administration, and worked on some of the early climate change um, action in the city in the back in the early aughts. And sort of as a consequence of that, as as well as a number of other things. Um, over the years have developed a, a sort of um, habit, I guess I would say, of filing amicus briefs in big climate cases at the, at the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals and at the U.S. Supreme Court, along with other jurisdictions, on behalf of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the National League of Cities, um, the International Municipal Lawyers Association, and also sometimes um, cohorts of individual cities who will sign on to these briefs. So we've, we've weighed in in a number of cases the, the final thing I'll just flag quickly on, on my and our work at the Sabin Center uh, when it comes to cities and, and greenhouse gas emissions is we are also a member of a, a new um, coalition called the Smart Services Coalition, um, which will be working hopefully with nine pilot cities here in the U.S. as well as cities in India to implement a suite of policies um, around smart surfaces, um, referring not only to green infrastructure, but also to um, other forms of carbon sequestered um, concrete and cement, um, gray infrastructure, white roofs, um, and a wide range of other policies to address not only the, the heat impacts of climate change, but also as a way to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So um, I'll just close by saying I'm ex also ex uh, excited to be on this panel. My expertise may be a little bit less technical um, than the others that are here and a little less expert in many regards, but I'm happy to play the lawyer in the room for this panel. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. And Michael Ogletree, thanks. Yeah, uh, my name is Michael Ogletree. I'm the director of the Air Pollution Control Division um, for the state of Colorado. 
you know, uh, my background prior to coming to here, I've been in this role about a year and a half now. Prior to that, I was with the city and county of Denver, um, running their air quality program for about five years. Um, and then prior to that, uh, as an analytical chemist, looking at stationary sources, um, you know, here at the division, uh, at the state level, you know, we created in 2019, um, you know, it, it was through legislation, statewide greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, so pretty aggressive goals, pretty aggressive goals. We started initially with four FTE in that space, um, but through uh, the last couple of years, we've increased that to about 18. Um, we haven't yet filled all of those roles, but you know, certainly with uh, a lot of the legislation and hitting a lot of those targets, um, really needing to kind of uh, staff up. We've been hiring a lot lately, so if anyone out there is interested, um, you know, uh, that program itself, um, you know, we've passed, you know, in the last couple of years. Um, a handful of different rules, you know, around light duty vehicles phasing out, phasing out of FHC products, um, and then additional greenhouse gas reduction requirements um, for the oil and gas sector, um, as well as different sectors. Um, you know, we've really tried to also include a lot of environmental justice outreach and components um, throughout all of our rulemakings and, you know, different goals. So making sure that we um, are including those in our work. Um, we actually have a dedicated person in that climate unit to help support a lot of that, just to make sure that we are listening to communities as we're passing a lot of these rules and regulations. Um, so with that, I'll uh, hand it back over to Anne-Marie. Great, thank you so much. Well, I'm really excited. We have an excellent panel here. Uh, different perspectives represented a lot of depth of experience. Um, so maybe just let's get, dive into some details. So if you folks could tell us a little bit more, what are your greenhouse gas information needs? Is it really just emission estimates or is there other type of information you require? And maybe give us a little hint about spatial scales, temporal scales. What is it you really uh, need to know? And I can let you guys, you know, chime in as uh, you pipe up, or I can call on names if we uh, need that. But I see Phil's unmuted, so we'll let you go. <laughs> Thanks. Is that the signal? Just unmute. Um, yeah, so um, uh, local air districts, and I'm sure states too, uh, uh, are generally have pretty good activity data because uh, we've been doing, um, um, you know, traditional air quality emissions inventories for a long time. Uh, so we probably ha have access to better data than any national study or global study uh, that uh, in terms of traffic, location of traffic, you know, our, our industrial activity, land use, all of those things. So we're pretty good at bottom up inventories, uh, although, you know, to the extent that our emission factors are, are good. And often uh, some are good and some are not good. So there's a few areas where uh, we could use some help, obviously, around methane. Uh, there's a lot of questions around landfill, methane emissions, uh, distribution, pipeline leaks, and then just more generally, the whole life cycle emissions of those, not just locally. Um, and, and refrigerants are another one. Uh, but when I think what would really be helpful is not just another published paper uh, with another number, um, because you could cherry pick those numbers once on one side or the other. More authoritative numbers that uh, we don't need, when we're doing a policy making or a rule making, we don't need another debate over which number to use. I think that could be a role that, uh, that the National Academies can play is some you know, consensus reports or synthesis reports that really settle on, it, on the best number that we can rely on. It's not uh, uh, something, again, we, we're gonna be debating enough during some of these policy makings that, um, uh, so we don't want to do that, but it's not just one number either. And getting to spatial scales, obviously there's different emission factors and even different life cycle assessments that happen regionally or locally. So the extent that whatever is developed can have uh, regional or sub-regional data, but again, blessed with the academies and a consensus report or something like that would avoid one of many, many, many <laughs> arguments and debates we have when we're engaging in rulemaking. Great, that's helpful. And I'm going to turn over to Michael Ogletree. Does that uh, resonate with you, Michael, in terms of your work in Colorado and what the agency has and needs? Yeah, you know, it does. I mean, for us, as I mentioned, we do have these targets. You know, for us, we're, you know, looking to reduce 26% um, by 2025 from 2005 base levels and then 50% by 2030. 
um, you know, we do our statewide uh, GHG inventory at least every two years, and you know, we're working towards tracking the, the progress through those projects. You know, as we think about what what that looks like in terms of what Philip mentioned, um, you know, for us, we're trying to work with sources to to create um, an intensity value for the work that they're doing. Um, so we're trying to do it on a source by source basis, and we actually have a rulemaking coming up um, in a couple of months here at the state to help better get better data to better inform, you know, um, some of the rules that we'll, we'll be putting out after that. Um, so to, to Phil's point, you know, the more data and, and the better we can get around it, um, you know, the, the better information, the better informed policy we can have in the future as well. Um, what we've learned through that um, stakeholder process is that it's not easy. <laughs> um, so, you know, we've had um, a lot of discussions, both virtually and in person, and we found, you know, working with academics and experts, um, getting people in the room to help identify the best way to um, create, you know, very, very well ground truth information and data is just has been really important. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll have a better understanding of what that looks like in the next couple of months. Great, that were helpful comments, thank you. Robert, in the C40 work, do you, do you see common needs across all the cities you're working with, or there's a lot of variation in what they're after? I think, I mean, there, there's the needs that respect to kind of the current reporting that's out there, and then there's kind of what are the needs that you need to, you know, drive some of the actions that you're looking for, right? And so, you know, from the city's perspective, there is, you know, the, the, the traditional activity-based inventory work that, that's taking place and the challenges that they have in, you know, obtaining data from utility companies. Uh, for example, from understanding, the, you know, methane leaks from landfills for, or from leakages even from the fossil gas infrastructure uh, within their own cities. Um, but then there's, you know, the, the linkages between, you know, cities' climate actions and, and the influence they may have on uh, business within their city, on the influence of regional governments and then kind of state and, and national. And so how do we integrate um, the data and, and the and emissions uh, and, and hopefully then the actions that are needed to be able to help um, support actions on, on all levels. And certainly with, you know, businesses within, within a jurisdiction, as you can imagine, you know, with, if they're reporting on task force climate disclosure and have their own, um, uh, greenhouse gas reductions and net zero journeys, certainly the success of the city being able to provide infrastructure uh, to be able to help them reduce their emissions. There's an interdependence there and we see similar interdependence then on the cities and, and what the states are doing with respect to energy grid in particular uh, and what the federal government is doing. And so with, with the Inflation Reduction Act right now, um, we are seeing kind of how do we downscale uh, what is, you know, plan and the reductions coming from that to the city level and, and, and how do you kind of determine what levers you need to pull. Um, we look at what cities can do within their direct control, but then we also look at what's within their influence and what can they advocate for. And so that's where it's really important that whatever we're doing, that it basically is able to be uh, consistent in terms of being applied. And, and so that means we've got to be looking at things from data from different scales. Um, and, and really on the city side of it, it really is having that localized scale as possible to be able to inform policy and action. And so you need the emissions, uh, but you also need some attached uh, spatial uh, information and disaggregated information to make meaning of that. So there's a lot in there. Um, and I guess lastly, on the consumption-based emissions front of it, I think, I think that's really important. Um, because you know, it is the question of what is the influence that, again, back to what, what is within direct control rather than what is just simply happening within the city. And certainly on the consumption side of it, and we talk about things like clean construction, where's your steel coming from? Where's your concrete coming from? Um, being able to actually have real data to be able to understand that those emissions and where they're coming from and, and be able to put policies to reduce those and then recognize those, um, I think is really important. Um, yeah, I'd say on the last print is really regional emissions. And, you know, it's not just kind of our, you know, large cities, the, the fastest growing parts of, of, of population growth and development is happening uh, in the suburbs. And so how are we able to now start to kind of make action in a, in a 
cohesive way um, with regional governments to be able to see those those reductions that are required um, because the actions are not you know on the island of any one city we need to be looking at it uh, on a regional basis yeah now those are some interesting different perspectives robert in, in uh the kind of information and then that connectedness of the different scales i think we're going to hear that theme all throughout our discussions today yeah mike some comments from you from your uh, different view Sure. I mean, I think that that all of these points actually, as you as you've underscored, uh, sort of touch on the key the key issues. I think that um, the the usability and implementability of the data is, is is a key issue from a legal perspective. And in our engagements with cities, that's often where we come in less on the sort of construction of the inventory and the benchmarking process itself, um, and more on okay, what are we going to do with this information, and how can we actually use this in order to take measures that will have the effect of reducing emissions. And in, in that regard, I think I would just flag maybe two, two thematic points. One is variability. There is a tremendous variability among cities um, in the United States in the approaches that they're taking to greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Even, you know, Robert can probably speak more specifically about like variation within the C40 network and, and well, why, but you're dealing with things, you know, from Ithaca, New York to Portland, Oregon to New York City. It's a, it's a, it's a, it is a, it's it's it is a wide range and they're each operating within a different state context and the relationship between the cities and the state governments and the relationship between the authority of the municipality within the context of a state constitutional and legislative framework um, does define to a large extent what unit, what, what cities and local governments can do and can't do. Um, and so I just think that, you know, obviously there's always going to be the quest for the one number, or the one methodology to rule them all, um, but query whether or not that's realistic and feasible and think more about how, how are different places going to use different approaches. Um, the, the issue of what's under your control, I think, is really central in thinking about this from a legal perspective, because there is a great deal spatially that will appear, um, you know, as within a city's jurisdiction, because it appears within the city's territory that is not under its authority to do very much about at all. And consumption-based emissions um, sort of is a test case for how far authority can go in that direction. I think I think of that as kind of one extreme example where cities may, you know, seek to push the envelope uh, a fair amount in, in trying to trying to reduce those consumption-based emissions. Um, depending on how far they they want to go, but transportation is like a less extreme, but you know much more visible um, and sort of currently existing cross cutting problem because all of those cars are trucks, ships, um, you know interstate fre freight are moving through these jurisdictions, but the cities have very limited authority to do anything at all about that, and you know to the extent that they can influence state action. That's one thing and the extent to which the federal government's vehicle emission standards, uh, aircraft standards, shipping emission standards, and so forth and so on, you know, those directly impact how, how emissions appear in city um, inventories and in, and in city, um, you know, satellite imaging. So um, the, the, the hybrid approach that focuses, a hybrid approach or one of a number of hybrid approaches that focuses on giving information to cities that they can use in order to take meaningful action, um, you know, seems to me to be the key. Awesome. Thanks for those thoughts, Mike. Um, and just one moment to encourage our audience again, feel free to submit questions in Slido and uh, get engaged in our conversation. Thank you. Uh, we, I see Michael, you uh, want to throw in one more comment here? Go for it. Yeah, no, just wanted to to comment a little bit on what Mike had mentioned around um, this jurisdiction and authority. I think that's a very important thing to 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 consider and think about. I know us here in in Colorado, you know, Denver um, put out building performance standards a couple of years ago. Um, we're now uh, at the state level doing you know similar statewide building performance standards. And there is conflict in, in what those look like. And, you know, as a regulatory authority at the state level, you know, we're trying to work with the city and county of Denver and learn from their experience, but it's hard to, to be perfectly in a line, in alignment with what their their um, their rules are. 
just because we have a much broader context we need to think about. And there is this overlapping jurisdiction, um, but as much as possible, we need to we need to have some at least some level of alignment so that we're all you know comparing apples to apples as we're looking um, at, at ways to really um, measure the impact of these GHGs and and not be in conflict if we can. Um, but we just have different considerations as a state government. Yeah, interesting. Um, I'm going to reel us a little bit back on the information track again. Um, we have a question from the audience, and they're asking about city climate plans. And, and you know, sometimes we get started in an activity, we don't have perfect information, but we don't want to wait till the perfect information is there to start moving forward. So if a city is trying to create a baseline climate plan, and uh, how can they get the kind of information that they need? And uh, what are your thoughts about setting intermediate goals, right? Maybe they don't have the information and know how to set a good goal for 2050 or 2070. Do they set some intermediate goals? So maybe from your experiences or the type of information you know you can get and you know you can't get, what are some thoughts about how cities uh, might be able to create climate plans, even if information is imperfect at the, get the start? I might as well kick in then from the city's perspective. Um, yeah, I mean, we're right now working uh, through uh, a review of, of various data collection uh, f around inventories and, and climate action plans with G uh, G Global Covenant of Mayors and CDP. Um, and really what we're looking at is trying to figure out like what are good, good enough proxies of data to be able to provide evidence for action. Right. And so my suggestion is like, you don't need a perfect greenhouse gas inventory to create a solid climate action plan. Um, you know, we know what the main levers are and sources of emissions in, in most cities and, you know, it's transportation buildings and waste. Um, and so really an inventory should not really change what it is that is the right action for doing um, what a city should take. Uh, you know, it gives you a way to track of, of your progress as you're, as you're coming along ideally but it really shouldn't change the nature of, of, of action that, that needs to be taken. And so if our goal is, you know, zero emissions by 2050, then I think, you know, it, regardless, we're looking at a, at a steep decarbonization pathway and, and actions that are gonna be, uh, be supporting that. Bill, what do, you, what do you think as a man who's been in a few of these air quality management distant organizations, how do you make plans and what are your thoughts? Well, I, I agree with Robert. You don't you don't need perfect information in, in, in most cases, especially in the in the context of climate planning. Uh, and this gets back to sort of the legal authority discretion uh, discussion we just had is that a lot of the actions that cities can take, regional agencies can take are using authorities that might not be directly related to GHG reductions, uh, but have uh, other co-benefits, you know, congestion relief, increasing transit public transit ridership, land use policies, all of these things that um, have other benefits as well, but can be done in a way that maximize the climate benefits are things that you don't need a, a, a comprehensive climate plan or inventory to actually do. You know, you're heading in the right direction and there should be enough technical information to make sure you're giving uh, GHG emissions uh, full treatment. Yeah, thanks. Others? All right, I'm not seeing hand raising or unmuting from our other panelists, so uh, we'll bring in another question. You know, Cameron, uh, I guess I'll just I'll just chime in quickly sure. um, and sort of looking at it from a from a legal perspective. Um, there is, and others correct me if I'm wrong on this. I'm I'm unaware of like a particular criteria that information must meet in order to justify a city's taking action to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. The for the most part. These plans or pledges or commitments are embodied in policies that are not legislated. Um, certainly not, you know, based in the city's charter or something like that. Um, and so there are policy commitments that are being made. And um, I think that the, the tracking point is really the key. We we kind of know what where we need to get to, right? We we need to get to 50% by 2030 and net zero by 2050. That's the that's the goal. Um, and so we know, and we know what the pathways are to do that in cities, go after buildings, go after transportation through a, you know, through the multi-layered uh, approaches that are available and go after waste uh, and maybe after consumption as well. 
um, all with an all with an eye to equity uh, and justice. Um, so the numbers are helpful because they might direct policy towards the higher emitting areas or locations, like depending on how how granular it really does get. But it, as, a, as a general matter, we kind of know the pathways, um, and there's nothing about the data that's going to stop a city from seeking to decarbonize its building sector. Um, all, all the data can do is sort of help specify where and, and exactly how quickly it should happen, I guess. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, I would almost turn this questions on its head. And for example, if, if interested citizens wanted to work with their city government and really try to advocate for change, you know, it's, it's like you guys were saying, it, you shouldn't be held back by saying, oh, we don't know enough just yet, that there's steps one can take, there's large scale sort of areas of focus. And I like what you said, Phil, about the co-benefits are another great area to think about, right? Congestion relief, air quality reduction, all these benefits that come from making a plan to address, say, transportation. Yeah. Well, all I right. Think, gonna, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, it's it's important to understand, you know, what are the regulatory levers that, that cities actually do have? And so then what are the right kind of metrics that, you know, maybe you should be attaching your actions to. And so that's where air quality is a really valuable one in, in being able to attach air quality, you know, air quality being a proxy for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, maybe that is the one where, where you need that, you know, better level of, of quantification to be able to make that case. Um, but, you know, there's other metrics like congestion that, or or like affordability and cost. It, it all depends on, on what the action is. And so it's important to understand what are the key actions cities can take to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and what are the what are the various kind of co benefits to that. And through that, that's where you can kind of start to design the policy interventions. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate the comments. Taking another question from our audience on a slightly different topic. Um, so let's say we've got these climate action plans and changes are happening. Is there sort of real time or prior uh, ec quarter economic information that's helpful, like construction, installation of infrastructure, heat pumps, et cetera? Are those well tracked as we move towards climate goals? Uh, I think a lot of our conversation is focused on concentration measurements, but clearly other uh, information can help us see if change is happening. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, definitely on, we have pretty good data on the production side. We know how much natural gas is being used, how much, you know, electricity demand is, is changing. Um, uh, we know, and, and, you know, gasoline sales, diesel sales. So we have pretty good information on, on, on being able to track it. Uh, but I also don't want to discount the need for doing some top-down analysis to be able to show that there's been overall change. It gets to some of the trade-off questions uh, that we often get into and need data for in terms of, um, you know, some of the shorter-term impacts and are people, delay, you know, if you ban purchases of, of, let's say, a certain type of appliance, you know, does that mean people are just stockpiling or putting off uh, making changes or our estimates of the transition uh, accurate or is there delays? There's lots of things to look at to see if our policies were designed correctly, which is another area of research that I think we would all benefit from is looking across all the cities and all the different policies that are tailored to different legal authorities in different situations. But there's probably enough commonality where if we, you know, had had a, a forum or research or something to show what's working, what's not working, and we could sort of learn from each other's mistakes, I think that could be very helpful. Thanks, Phil. Robert? Yeah, I mean, I think with policies like building performance standards, it's pretty, you know, it, it, it's in the regulation in terms of like what the outcome needs to be like. And I think we, that, that obviously needs to be evaluated. It's more so where there's not the regulation you're relying on voluntary or incentivized based approaches that, you know, you're really not sure, um, you know, what the outcome is going to be. And so, um, I think there is a need to find a way to be able to track it, but oftentimes the outcome is going to be found in, in the utility data that you're going to see hopefully a response in, in, in what's in what's happening. So 
I think it, the you know we we can we, we can monitor and, and evaluate the effectiveness of certain policies and interventions. I'd argue one of the most challenging ones would be around land use planning and transportation because that is more of a, a lagging type outcome you're, you're going to have and a lot harder to kind of characterize what is the exact change you're going to be able to see and and then you have you know the effects of you know where people are fueling up whether or not it's within the, the jurisdiction or outside the jurisdiction and, and things like that so it gets really messy when you're kind of talking outside of buildings and and looking at land use planning and you know the challenging part is that you know a lot of the plans are you know 20 20 years you know out and and they are baking in emissions and, and transportation behaviors um and so how do we you know get good data and good information as these plans are being developed and updated to really be able to um, I guess, highlight, you know, the outcomes of, of various scenarios such that it actually can influence, you know, how we kind of build our cities and, and, and where we put our money in terms of infrastructure. Um, that, that, that's a really challenging one. Um, Interesting. Yeah. All right. If our other panelists uh, don't want to chime in, we've got plenty of questions now queued up. Thank you. Our audience has come alive. Um, I'm going to take this next question um, from a, a, what they're asking is regarding the comments on limited need for accurate or specific information for policy. What are your thoughts if uh, reductions generate credits in a market? Would accuracy be in important then to establish tradable credits. And I think this is, again, uh, this is bringing up this idea of what if there really is a carbon market and then we're going to have to better quantify, monetize uh, what's happening. So any thoughts on that? Mike, go for it. Yeah, I can, I can jump in first, I guess. I mean, the types of projects that are going to generate credits, carbon credits for participation in a voluntary or regulated market are going to be happening at a scale where measurement is much more localized and individualized um, and will have to be demonstrable, right? You can't, you can't get the credit and put it on the market unless you can verify the reduction. And those projects are happening really at a micro scale. Um, Within, within urban contexts to the extent that they're happening within, within urban contexts, right? So you're talking about particular replacement of, um, or a particular project that's gonna result in a particular set of reductions in one particular place, not citywide policy or statewide policy for cities um, and, and local governments. Um, so I, I, I guess I don't, I don't know enough about it to say whether or not it's a different kind of analysis, but it does strike me that it may be a different type of analysis than you know the one in this report. The the types of analyses that are the focus of this report, um, and it's a much more sort of tailored individual accounting of particular reductions from some one or several actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand that. Other thought from panelists. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll chime in. I think you know for us when we're trying to create something like this, which we're trying to do um, for our intensity rulemaking. I mean, that's um, for oil, it's for oil and gas, um, which is it's maybe not this audience, but it certainly is, right? We're trying to find how we can specifically quantify and create a rule around that. And that's been one of the bigger challenges. It's hard to create very specific metrics for a lot of these different um, emissions. And how do we tie that in an accurate way that is, um, a way that's replicable from, you know, source to source um, to be able to actually create a method for doing that trading. Because if you don't have a way that every every source can actually do it in a way that's replicable, to your point, like, we you can't do that. Um, Uh, yeah, no, and these comments are great. Like, as you say, Michael, some of the, the report was focused on uh, a different, perhaps, motivation. And you guys are talking about practical, actual things that people are trying to get done and the kind of information gaps you have. So it's really informative. Bill? I was just going to pile on there um, for a lot of the trading or offset generating programs. Um, there's There's protocols that run hundreds of pages long that set up exactly what you have to do it 
you know, and, and it also creates the huge need for in, sort of enforcement around that. I mean, some of these protocols are requiring ac activities to continue 20, 30, 50 years into the future. Uh, you, you can imagine if, if, if this was a path we went on and there were, we, we you know, upscaled the amount of projects uh, to the level that would be needed, the amount of sort of bureaucratic infrastructure needed to maintain that would be quite large, not to mention we'll learn something in those 20, 30, 40 years that change, should change those value of those credits uh, that we didn't consider before. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Phil. All right, I think we're gonna squeeze in one more question before we run out of time here. Um, so one of our uh, participants asked, with the role of combustion sources, land use policy, and other kind of factors, you have this interplay of greenhouse gases uh, and air quality. And what are your jurisdictions and your organizations thinking about when they try to optimize GHG reductions, but also thinking about the environmental justice benefits? So uh, tell us a little bit about the, the interplay of these GHG goals and environmental justice objectives. I, I could start. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're hugely connected because when we're looking at, you know, as well, some of the market transformation and the actions that are, that are required and, and means, you know, oftentimes there's government funding attached to it. It, it just, this is the opportunity to uh, attach those, 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 those subsidies and those benefits to those, um, uh, environmental justice communities. And, um, you know, we're seeing the opportunities, for example, for zero emission freight um, and, and where, where you basically can, can improve localized air quality. Those are the, the areas most vulnerable in EJ communities are often where there's a lot of those fleets being housed. And so we are doing targeted air quality measurement in those communities. And we're seeing cities looking at what, are, what can they do within their jurisdiction to be able to help um, reduce, uh, uh, support the rapid electrification of vehicles um, in those neighborhoods. But we're also seeing targeted uh, building retrofits and building decarbonization programs targeted for those communities. So, you know, I think I think we're, we are seeing uh, things moving in the right direction in terms of the supports and, and the opportunities uh, led by government happening um, within EJ communities. Um, with the hope that then you're, you know, that also supports building capacity of industries to be able to um, support more broader based, um, you know, decarbonization and specifically buildings and transportation. Thanks, Robert. Phil, go for it. Yeah. Well, I would agree with Robert that the, um, the uh, you know, mo it mostly aligns what we would be doing in terms of GHG reductions and improving uh, exposure in communities. Uh, it's not always the case. Um, and there's, I can give you many examples. I mean, but one we're dealing with right now is composting, for example. A lot of the composting facilities end up being in uh, underserved communities. Um, there's lots of issues around trucking and odors and other types of emissions. So I think air, quali air quality regulation historically has not been <laughs> designed to uh, address the concerns of these really local impacts. Uh, so as we're looking at, at, at climate change planning, um, I think we can do a better job uh, from the beginning as the air quality world is also moving towards looking at these local impacts in a better way. Uh, but it doesn't always align, and we often find that in some communities, uh, you know, while local air quality they may be their biggest priority, um, perhaps uh, GHG emissions are not. Um, we have to respect that. Uh, a lot of the work we do in communities needs to be really community driven and listen to what the, the, the community members' vision for their own community is. Um, but I do think we can lean into the areas where 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 the where the uh, outcomes do align, um, uh, which which is what we've been doing in the Bay Area. Thanks for those comments, Phil. Mike, anything you want to know? All right. Well, we're just a few minutes away from the wrap up. Uh, this has been really interesting discussion uh, with the range of perspectives. Any uh, last minute comments folks might want to uh, share with the maybe with the perspective of uh, given what we talked about in the greenhouse gas information uh, report and the pillars that Kevin mentioned earlier, uh, if you could have a magic wand and get the community provide you two 
key pieces of information in the next year, what, what might that be? What can we do for you? And I can't change law. This is more, you know, technical measurement interpretation data. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to answer your question, Anne-Marie, but there's one point I did want to get in <laughs> before the end. And one of the things I think we struggle with, um, uh, and maybe outside the, this, the scope of this conversation or outside the scope of some of the, even the Academy's research, is really the micro and macroeconomics of the transition. Uh, we cannot do policymaking without doing extensive uh, analysis of sort of the economics of the, again, not just micro, micro and macro, but actually household economics. Uh, it's something we, we probably all do in different states and localities independently, but if there's any research or effort that can help uh, do that at a national scale, but be able to scale it down so we don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel every time we're, we're analyzing a policy, that would be super helpful. You can't, just like you can't draw geographical boundaries around air emissions or GHG emissions, you can't draw geographical boundaries around e economies either. So that might help us get to some of the leakage issues. So if that is in the wheelhouse of the academies, it's be something uh, we'd be very interested in. Interesting. All right. I'm going to go over to Michael uh, Ogletree. Any Thoughts on uh, information gaps that could actually practically be addressed uh, by the broader science community? I mean, I think if there were, you know, some kind of uniform, um, some kind of development of like a uniform inventorying method um, so that we can, you know, have a, a standard that's more widely adopted, it'll provide us, you know, better information. Um, and I think just, larger data sets that we can that are more accurate to better inform policy yeah no i think you actually answered my question in your starting comments but thank you uh how about you mike any thoughts no i mean not not really i think that um we've touched on a, on a number of things there obviously are some are some gaps but it does seem like you know greater refinement uh, and particularity that's driven by potential use and implementation um, is, is what's in order. Great, great. And Robert, I'm gonna give you our last 30 seconds, thoughts on practical information we can provide. I think just the information that can be applied at the, the, you know, the local scale. So building level, city scale, state, and, and national scale, if they all agree with each other. So that you know, when we're talking about actions, we are talking about the same, you know, CO2 uh, that, that, you know, that, that we're looking at both mitigating and, and that we can have consistent actions among them. And I think, you know, with, with now corporations now increasingly needing to come up with credible pathways, that that agreement is really um, important. And we certainly want to see that recognition of city actions uh, with national commitments and national actions so that then the funding can flow to cities as well in order to who rely on who are going to be the drivers of implementation on this. So, so seeing that opportunity to really um, have everybody kind of collectively uh, working together and what are the information needs to be able to, we're all on the same page of, of what those emissions are and, and where they are going. Yeah, great. Thank you again to our panelists. I'm sorry, I'm uh, already run a minute over. So we're going to wrap up this session. Appreciate your comments. And then we'll see a number of you back uh, in our final wrap up at the end of the day. Thank you again. And I'll hand this back to uh, uh, Rachel and the NASM crew. Rachel, I think I, I'll pick up the baton if that's okay. Um, so we're gonna launch into our session three, um, identifying tools to better inform urban decision makers in the US. And it really is a nice follow on to the excellent um, discussion we just had. So our goal in this session is to discuss existing or potential assets and tools in the public private and research sectors at urban scales to aid local decision-making in the US. Um, we have a panel of experts to discuss some of the tools used in their work. They represent, I think, a diversity of backgrounds and scales, and we're lucky they could take time to share their thoughts. Um, just logistics for our, our session. We have 45 minutes in total. Each of uh, our speakers will have five minutes to provide their remarks. I'll give a verbal one minute cue at four minutes. Once all the speakers have gone, we'll have, as we've done in the previous couple sessions, a larger group Q&A. 
so everybody out there, if you have a question, please submit it um, via Slido. Um, what I think I'll do is I'll I'll give a, a one sentence introduction of each of the speakers and then we'll start at the top. Um, and if I don't give an adequate description of your background, go ahead and embellish that before you you share your your thoughts and slides. So first up is Leslie Ott. Leslie is a climate scientist at NASA where she currently leads the carbon group within the global modeling and assimilation office. Next up is Emma Lewin is a senior associate with RMI, an independent nonpartisan nonprofit organization of experts across disciplines working to accelerate the clean energy transition. Catherine Atkin uh, is an attorney, climate entrepreneur, and urban planner focused on building the policies and enabling the environment needed to drive global decarbonization and sustainable development. Catherine will not be presenting slides. Um, and then AJ Nagpur is an urban system scientist at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Princeton University. So why don't we go ahead and start with Leslie. Uh, you have five minutes, Leslie. All right, thanks, Kevin. Thanks for the great introduction and to everybody who's been coordinating for a, a great uh, meeting so far. So I'm gonna, in, in five minutes, try to tell you a, about a few of the things we're, we're doing at NASA to both create better greenhouse gas information and to deliver that to people um, in new ways. Are, NASA, are you guys showing slides? I think so. If not, I'm just going to go for it. Okay, so uh, first up, people probably know that NASA launches a lot of satellites, makes a lot of observations to help tell us about greenhouse gas uh, concentrations. Uh, but the other important step is to, to take all of the information that we get from satellites, um, things like observations of the land surface, things like nighttime lights, air quality species, and of course, greenhouse gas concentrations, and integrate that into a holistic picture that tells us about how sources and sinks and concentrations are varying. And so early on in Kevin's introduction, you heard some of the discussion of how we need to operationalize those data sets to be able to deliver them more reliably on uh, a global sense. Thank you. All right, there we go. So this is our little schematic of information flowing through all the way from observations to integration with models to a 40 atmospheric state of, of greenhouse gas concentrations. So we're able to deliver this now with a few months latency. And, and the important advances that this enables are things like independent verification with aircraft data, ability to detect anomalies quickly, and ability to serve uh, regional models uh, more regularly. That's really important because at the global scale, we're producing good quality quality products but the for the, the do serve all urban areas but the hook is that there's a limitation in spatial scale right now we're at something like a 50 kilometer scale which is really challenging for urban stakeholders to use so we're working to get that down to something closer to 10 kilometers we'd love to be at the single kilometer scale but there's still always going to be a need for this tiered modeling approach to, to help bridge that gap so I want to say we're making progress and this is one piece of that uh, with a lot of need to connect to some of the local scale efforts um, that we're discussing here. So next slide. So the next piece that I want to hit, hit on is not just making new and better data from combination of observations uh, and models, but being able to deliver that data in newer ways. And so on the on the busy um, right hand side of this plot, left hand side of this plot, sorry, you're seeing something that looks a lot like the previous slide. On the right hand side, you're seeing something that looks more uh, like a diagram of data systems. And this is emphasizing some of the new cyber infrastructure initiatives that NASA has, really working to get all of our data up in the cloud uh, and make sure that that conforms with new open uh, data policies. That's something that Ron hit on that's very important, doing our science, uh, not just good quality science, but science out in the open. Could you go back for just a second? Uh, thank you. So uh, making the data available in the cloud is important, but also connecting that to shared analytic tools that allow scientists to collaborate on methods and visualization tools that allow both scientists and lay people, practitioners, to be able to access the data in new ways to facilitate their use of greenhouse gas information. And so in this pilot project, which has been going on for about a year, we've been working really hard to move NASA greenhouse gas data to the cloud to be able to develop new tools to work with it so that we can improve the reliability and uh, transparency of the work that we do, uh, and to demonstrate interoperability of some of the many data sets that 
we have, because that's one challenge. We have a wealth of information and we need to be able to use those data sets together to understand the whole picture of greenhouse gases. So the last slide, go ahead and go to the next one now, is really making sure that we, when we develop these new cyber infrastructure tools, that that serves uh, both science and applications users. So these use cases that were developed through this project called the Earth Information System were co-developed with colleagues at the EPA to help inform inventory planning and also to make sure that the inventory uh, data that were produced at the national scale are more accessible. And those priority use cases include things like gridded inventories, making those data sets available more uh, reliably, making them more quickly, uh, complementing uh, anthropogenic emissions information with the best quality information on natural sources and sinks so that we again get the big picture of greenhouse gases, and also really delivering new tools for uh, detecting and mitigating hotspot emissions using combinations of aircraft and satellite data. And so I want to say that we're making a lot of progress connecting with colleagues at EPA and colleagues at, at NIST and NOAA, like you heard about earlier, to understand what the federal landscape should look like. But one of the real challenges um, and opportunities here is hearing and integrating input from the urban perspective, because as we, we heard before, there's a, a variety of perspectives, a variety of technical capacities. And so we're, we're looking forward to, to showing you more as this evolves and to hearing more uh, from all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. That was great. Um, right on time. And I'll hand it over to Emma Lewin um, for her five minutes. Great. Thanks so much, Kevin. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be participating uh, in this discussion today. And thank you to the National Academy for inviting me to speak about the City Climate Intelligence Initiative. Uh, and so as we've heard from the preceding panel discussion, there are still many greenhouse gas emission information and usability gaps that need to be addressed to support climate action at the urban level. And it's with this challenge in mind that RMI, in partnership with Carbon Monitor, the Hestia Project out of Northern Arizona University, NEXT, and I guess out of the World Meteorological Organization, have gotten together and developed and piloted a next generation open data methodology to deliver near real time, high resolution greenhouse gas emissions data for cities globally. And so on the screen here, you can see um, our piloted data for Los Angeles. But before we dive in, I'd really just like to take a moment to talk about the City Climate Intelligence or CCI initiative more broadly. Advance slide, please. So there are increasingly large amounts of previously untapped public data that can help us to develop estimations for greenhouse gas emissions in cities. And the CCI initiative leverages this untapped data by developing a methodology which includes both bottom-up data sources such as local data sets and top-down data sources such as remote sensing to establish a novel approach for emissions estimation. And recognizing that there currently exists a varied level of greenhouse gas emission capabilities and access across cities globally, we've developed three tiers of granularity for urban greenhouse gas emissions estimates. And so tier one provides daily sectoral estimates across seven emitting sectors at 10 kilometer granularity. And tier two and three provide emissions estimates at the neighborhood and asset scale, respectively. And this tiered approach is intended to meet the varying needs of all cities. Advance slide, please. So the tier one provides a starting place for emissions information for cities that currently have limited access to emissions data and can be a very helpful source of emissions information for developing inventories or tracking carbon budget budgets. Uh, advance slide, please. While tier two and three data were developed for cities that are familiar with greenhouse gas emissions data and likely already have GHG emissions inventories, but are looking for a more granular data to help inform, deploy, and track climate action at the urban level. And so to date, we've developed tier one data for an estimates for 53 cities globally, and that's available on our project website. And we've piloted more our more granular tier two and three data in Paris, Los Angeles, and Copenhagen. Next slide, please. So just to give a quick example of how tier two and three data can be useful for cities to drive climate action, 
This slide demonstrates the opportunity of leveraging granular greenhouse gas emissions data with other data sources, such as household income, building roof size, energy bill data, among others, to identify high emitting, low income neighborhoods that could be targeted by a low income rooftop solar program to see the greatest climate and equity impact in neighborhoods across uh, the region of LA. And so the map on the left demonstrates the emissions impact potential from installing rooftop solar on households earning less than $50,000 per year, with the red areas being the highest emissions reduction potential and the blue being lower emissions reduction potential. And while the table on the left provides us with some of the key impact statistics under two scenarios, targeting households earning under $25,000 per year and under $50,000 per year. As we can ta see toggling the income threshold for a rooftop solar deployment does not substantially change the individual energy savings per household, but a rooftop solar program targeted at homeowners earning under 50,000 versus under 25,000 per year does allow for a larger intervention and corresponding emission savings. And so this is just one example of how the tier two and tier three data in combination with other data sets can drive insights for cities to better understand the emissions reduction potential of policies and programs in addition to targeting those programs where they are most needed and can have the biggest impact. Uh, next slide, please. One minute. So I'd just like to quickly wrap up with highlighting that a core tenant of this work is data transparency and accessibility. Uh, the CCI initiative is really about developing greenhouse gas emissions data as a public good that is accessible to all. We liken it to the public weather data service, so emissions data needs to be universally acceptable, accessible, updated with a frequency that is helpful to its users, and provided by an independent third party. And we believe that this sort of data can be leveraged not only by policymakers, but community members to understand how their community is progressing in terms of emissions reductions, as well as the private sector to identify and trace emissions reductions opportunities and investment projects in cities. So thank you for the time to speak about our CCI initiative, and I'm looking forward to the broader discussions with my colleagues. Perfect. Thanks, Emma. That was great. Um, next, and Catherine, I don't know if you're doing five minutes of um, comments or you're waiting for the panel discussion, let me know. Uh, happy to do either. I do have some points to make, but- Oh uh, yeah, no, no, please make your points. I just wasn't sure. Since yeah, I know no, you're showing slides. Typical typical lawyer comes in with no slides, nothing <laughs> nothing really uh, you know, too detailed. So I really but wanna say super appreciate being a part of this day of reflection and being with these amazing uh, cutting edge, just high impact scientists. And I think what we're, you know, here today to do and what the what the report was really driving at is how can we uh, create higher impact, more comprehensive GHG data that can drive more effective climate action decarbonization? And how do we create, and what I want to talk about is how do you create the enabling environment for that? Because as we've seen in the some of the earlier panelists and the sort of disconnect between the technologists and that the advancements that we're making in creating the opportunity for greater GHG uh, comprehensiveness, and then the reality on the ground in cities. So um, at the Climate Data Policy Initiative that I run at the Stanford Law School, we look at, well, what is the enabling environment? What are the sets of levers, both standards, uh, statutory and regulatory regimes, and financing and, and markets that can actually drive that the kind of decarbonization that we're looking for? So. Um, the study calls for a, a hybrid approach, and um, at the uh, Policy Institute, we're really interested in the unlocking the potential of next-gen technologies. So all of this, you know, work around machine learning and sensors and DLT, holding this real promise for getting more granular data. And I'd also like to um, posit that also data that is less resource intensive. And I think that's a real driver and important part of uh, deployment and scale. So. Um, this complete and atmospheric data is, is critical. And we're seeing certainly at the global and national levels where people where we have entities making commitments, really shining a light on are we actually understanding what the GHG emissions are is critical and drives change. I think what we have to, the nut we have to crack at the city level is there, these are voluntary. Um, enterprises, and we have to figure out what is the way in which we incentivize and actually support uh, GHG data usage of the kind that we're proposing. 
Um, so I'd like to propose that we look at, well, what is that minimum viable data product? When do we need it? And how do we make an argument to cities or encourage and support them to use it? So um, I think that we are underestimating emissions in important ways. We've seen that at the city level. Um, we're not able to use tools to evaluate the efficacy of climate actions. We're talking about baselines, but we're, we're also talking about what are those do difference and how do we measure their effect? Um, and then, as I said, how do we do more with less? Um, I also just want to say, I think we're undervaluing the, the, the power of data for public engagement. And that's where cities, as we know, are powerful and that they're so close to residents. And it's it's a, an opportunity to do a lot more. A few things I'd like to just uh, talk about too is, you know, we do have, and let's talk later about some of the tailwinds that we have. We do have tech, climate tech innovation and research we do have city net zero commitments. We also have big new um, compliance regimes in the private sector, and we should think about how those interrelate. So when it comes to city and urban settings, how can we create this enabling environment and how do we create a support for this, uh, the uptake of, of more comprehensive GHG da data, these hybrid approaches? Uh, a few things. One is authoritative numbers. Somebody, another panelist said that. Uh, policymakers at the city level cannot... Uh, take in reams of different research and expect uh, their staff to figure out like what makes the most sense. So we certainly need standardization. And as the report says, institutionalization, we need gold standard third party verifiers that make it off the shelf easy for a city government to feel comfortable taking a scarce public dollar and doing something with it because they know they're not gonna you know, catch it on the other side. Um, also, we need to move beyond action plans and recognize that city, you know, climate action plans were something that cities did at the behest of the climate and environmental community. Um, and we need to help them figure out how these new uh, reporting mechanisms and approaches support that effort, because we, we, we are going to face the fact that those baselines may not be accurate in all cases. And so we have to help figure out how that works. I'd like to see a focus on um, new regulations at the city level around particular drivers things like waste and buildings and transportation have already been identified. What can be our verticals around that? And how do we use the, this, the sensor technology and other kind of atmospheric uh, approaches that can really make that work? So a few other things. I don't think we should you know, take off the table state uh, broader um, you know, enforcement regimes that can incentivize and not just compliance markets, but also uh, bring resources to cities when they're able to incorporate uh, more comprehensive GHG emissions. Also, just want to say, uh, I do think equity is a critical driver at the city level. So if we can show how GHG emissions, uh, comprehensive approaches in, you know, support uh, equity, we'll be making uh, great inroads. And lastly, I don't think we should take markets off the table. I think we should be monetizing uh, avoided emissions, and I think we've been a little too singular in looking at point so source, you know, pollution by uh, producers. So I think that's another place where comprehensive GHG emissions really makes a difference. So looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. That's great, Catherine. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. Next, we'll turn to AJ. And correct me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Sorry about yes, that. Yes, you pronounce it right. Exactly. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, yeah. So I, uh, I just want to uh, briefly introduce myself again. So before joining uh, Princeton, I was a director at uh, World Resource Institute. I was uh, developing a clean air action plan for cities. And during my work in uh, WRI, I formulated the policy, local policies, as well as try to implement policies on the ground. Could you please go to the next slide? Uh, so, uh, so the work which I'm right now I'm sharing, like we are following the same strategies for uh, other cities. I think, uh, uh, could you please go to the next uh, next slide? So this is a recent paper. And for this uh, type of work, what we are doing first, we are just first identifying like how, you know, different variables are affecting the uh, greenhouse gas emission as well as the air pollution. And most importantly, and I think we are trying to assess like how different socioeconomic categories of population are responsible for different infrastructure activities, as well as the air pollution and JG contribution. So that is the, our first goal. And after that, we are identifying the neighborhoods 
where we need to focus a particular kind of strategies. And what I feel that we cannot, I think, you know, that frame uh, uh, like one kind of uh, strategy for the entire city because city has a different neighborhood, different characteristic. So for that kind of analysis, it's very important to understand the city at the micro level. So that's what we are doing for both air pollution and air GG emission. And most importantly, city is more concerned about the activities, you know, that because they are not that much because the other sectoral people, they are more concerned about like, you know, what kind of activity they are doing and what, how, how can they improve? So could you please go to the next uh, slide? So, uh, and next please. Uh, so I think by identifying the contribution of the different socioeconomic segments and the, you know, that uh, how these different policies are going to benefit both air pollution and the GHG benefits uh, impact. So we have, I think this is, I think one of the paper like we have recently published where we are trying to identify the policies where we can get the both kind of benefits, you know. So, you know, for example, what generally what is happening, like, you know, that we, we are trying to highlight the city level strategies, but this, this work we have, found like just if you are only going to improve the 10% efficiency of the rich people that how it is going to affect the GHG and air pollution emission in the city. And if you want to de develop some kind of awareness program or something like that, it's very important to just consider these kind of things because that would improve the efficiency of the implementation and it will give us the practical solution. So that is the thing which we are doing. Another important thing is that like, whatever policies we are formulating or action plans we are trying to uh, implement in the city, first important thing is to uh, understand the stakeholders, you know, like mindset, that is the most important. And that when I say stakeholder, it doesn't mean like people who speak more, you know, the leaders. I think it's very important to talk to the ground level people, I mean, which we did in like a, in our previous work. And could you please go to the next slide? So, uh, uh, before joining here, I think I had developed a clean election power in one of the Indian cities where, you know, that first time I think we, I was able to convince the construction industry, like, you know, that how to mitigate air pollution on GHG emission on your site. And they, uh, uh, with them, uh, we develop a clean construction guideline. And, you know, that generally people are very, you know, that they, that these industry people, I think sometimes they don't want to just uh, try for uh, some kind of new things. But I think we were able to convince like, uh, you know, that these construction people and they have given one site to us. And on that site, we try to implement the, you know, the whatever the uh, strategy we have suggested and uh, on that site. And that in that way, we were able to understand the practicality of the policy, you know, the, because theoretically, it's very easy to do this, do that. But one minute. Yeah, practicality of this uh, policy. So we, uh, we did that on that site. And could you please go to the last uh, slide? Uh, yeah, so these kind of intervention we have done. Uh, the next slide, please. And uh, what we found, like with very simple intervention, we were able to, I think, reduce, I think, because the construction activities emission by 70 to 80 percent. And it was not required a lot of cost or money or something like that. So these kind of benefits which we can get if we consider the, you know, that stakeholder, uh, uh, you know, that uh, what they are thinking, what is their priority, and we can just try to match our priority with their priority. And so in that way, we'll get the option benefits with this. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, that was great. Um, so we'll, we'll um, turn over to um, getting some of these questions in and, and remind everybody if you have questions, put them in Slido. Um, we have a uh, two or three here. I'll start off with those. For Leslie, um, question is what is the temporal resolution of the data that you uh, will be sharing on the cloud? Um, do you imagine that this data could be used for acute exposure assessments and maybe public health? Yeah, that's a really good question, and um, it and I'll say it varies by product. So I so I won't go into every detail we're putting up on the on the cloud, but just to say that for some of the model based analyses um, that have the closest. Um, analog to air quality, you're looking at something like maybe hourly 
two, three hourly diagnostics, but there's a latency right now in delivering that data. So it's not available in near real time, but th that would uh, still put it in the ballpark for health assessments. What I think is actually more challenging than the temporal resolution is the spatial resolution that a lot of times when we're dealing with model grid cells, um, even fine resolution model grid cells, you're talking about something that might be a few kilometers to right now, you know, tens of kilometers across, and that can uh, represent a very large uh, variety of conditions within a within a model grid cell. So the approach that that's being taken a lot with air quality, and I think there is an analog to some of the work that particularly Ron showed earlier, is um, being able to make fine scale uh, measurements within a city that tell you how air quality. Uh, is varying, they can't be spatially complete. And in some cases they're made with low cost sensors. So they may not be the most accurate, but those data sets help us downscale what might be very good quality information, but over a broad area. And so I think that's where you're seeing this combination of the satellites giving you a global perspective uh, combined with models so you get ever information everywhere that can be downscaled with the combination of, uh, of local sensors. To me, that's the power of combining those kinds of approaches, but I'd, I'd welcome any other opinions on that? Yeah, you know, that's a really interesting comment about the sort of multi-tiered system. But the other thing I was thinking when you were when you were commenting about the spatial resolution and the limitations, because they are challenging. But I must say, you know, the, the recent work with methane and a lot of these very spot imagers, you know, is is impressive and is actually, you know, at the scale, at suburban scales. I mean, they're seeing hotspots of oil and gas wells, leakage, landfills, things like that. And that's a, I think has been an impressive um, evolution in the last decade around methane from space, which I think is just amazing. So yeah, uh, yeah go ahead. I, I mean, oh, and I'll just say, great. yeah, I think there's, there's some energy there on the methane side that's for, if you had a very large concentration that's causing a, a public health impact on the methane itself, I think there's a lot of opportunity with those measurements. If you're talking about something that is more the, the greenhouse gas air quality co-benefits, sometimes there's challenges with the, the accuracy of those data sets that haven't been vetted at more subtle concentrations. And so I think there's still a lot of work to be done to figure out how you use the data directly, but absolutely it's a, it's a big opportunity. Great. Um, next question. This is for Catherine. Um, can you explain more what you mean by having decision makers move past action plans? Um, what framework would you replace these action plans with? How to incorporate the new technologies to inform more specific local actions? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. And, and uh, it, it, what I would say is maybe not move beyond, um, but both and. I think what is important to recognize is that when we and, and uh, the last speaker said it so well in understanding who your stakeholders are. When we're talking about city, you know, cities, um, we are talking about city governments who have, you know, struck out, you know, a, a ahead of many others uh, globally and created climate action plans according to the GHG protocol and the community wide. Protocol, so they've done what they were asked to do in terms of creating a climate action plan, mm -hmm. and then they've brought along stakeholders to, um, you know, to get behind that, and then to make changes based on their baselines uh, and over time the changes, and make commitments. And some, in some, for some cities, these net zero commitments. And I guess what I want to say is, when you bring in much more comprehensive GHG data, there may be. Um, there, it may end up being that that those actual inventories are not as accurate as we thought they were. Um, it could be a plus, it could be a minus. Um, but um, and I think we just have to recognize the political reality of that, and and so to be, I think, sensitive to that, which is we want those cities to be rewarded for for getting out there on climate action. And so that, to my my point, is just that we we need to be at the table with them to figure out like how to do that. And that some of these vertical strategies, which are really the drivers, you know, we said waste and buildings and transportation, maybe places where, where um, you know, more comprehensive and atmospheric data and other sources could be used um, in a way that doesn't require them to like put their climate action plan on a shelf and start over again. But it could be we're taking deeper dives. We're going to use like best in class data um, to help us think about that. 
Any any other comments? Because that question is 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 a general one. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Okay. Um, let's see now. Uh, general question for everybody: In pursuit of just transitions, areas with energy poverty have been identified for certain U.S. cities. How do areas with measured GHG data vary? with areas of energy poverty or lesser energy consumption. So that sort of co-mapping of, of energy poverty and emissions. Feel free to jump in. I shared a map with income distribution, so I guess I should probably jump in on this one. <laughs> um, I think that's you know a really great, great point and question. And I think one of the things that we've learned through our work on the City Climate Intelligence Initiative has been that importance of contextualizing the greenhouse gas emissions that we're seeing across cities, um, and especially making sure that you know when we see a neighborhood and when we are getting down to these granular levels, we're providing that information about potentially why that those, those communities might be seeing higher greenhouse gas emissions. So for instance, as was mentioned in this comment, if you're a neighborhood or a community that isn't near a public transit system, then you're gonna see higher transportation emissions uh, in your community. And that's not necessarily because um, you know you you want to drive it's because that's probably the only choice that's available for you and so having having those layers of different contextual maps i think is is a really big part of you know responsibly sharing this data but it's also a very big part of the opportunity of being able to make this data actionable for for a wide variety of city stakeholders yeah that's really true and emma while 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 we're with you, a question uh, specific to you, what were the expectations of cities you met about near real time and location specific GHG emissions information? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think, you know, we we met with a large uh, array of cities throughout this project, um, both in Europe and the US, and we heard a lot of different answers. And so, you know, for many cities, it wasn't necessarily about how granular can you get, but how actionable can you be? And so I think that's where a lot of kind of the analysis that I showed really shows that opportunity um, because a lot of cities are, you know, they might have one data science or a handful of data scientists that can really go deep and really dig into hourly building emissions data. Um, but for the vast majority of cities, you know, that's probably too much information. And especially when we start talking about, you know, non policymakers like community activist organizations or others that might want to use this information, um, being able to have that very granular data and then conduct analysis to be able to present it to decision makers and community activists and, and others who might want to use that information in, you know, uh, digestible formats and digestible insights is really uh, kind of what we heard really clearly um, from our stakeholder engagement. Anybody else with thoughts on that? I just wanted yeah. to, you know, yeah. commend RMI for this work because I saw those slides and it's it's really exciting. And, and I think it's like, uh, I think the question is how do you scale RMI so that you have that capacity in all the, you know, in these cities for that kind of data. But I do want to say, I think when it comes to the, the equity issues, I think that will drive uh, the support for more comprehensive GHG emissions technologies and approaches. And I think um, the, in the same way that, you know, we're looking at uh, nations that have created all of, you know, spent all the carbon wallet and now want somebody else to like, you know, stop doing what they're doing. Uh, it, that's happening in, you know, in the United States in communities. So I think that also looking at consumption-based accounting and some of the other ways we look at that we're, you know, in the same way, low-income communities are not the ones driving our carbon footprint. So I think these are really, really interesting opportunities. Yeah. And that's a really good point about uh, consumption-based accounting, because it's always worth noting that when we talk about the atmospheric approaches and our activity-based approaches, the atmosphere is obviously not built to look at consumption-based accounting, which is fundamentally supply chain. Um, so it's something that we're gonna have to, I think we're gonna have to grapple with given how important 
supply chain perspectives are because they go to control and governance purview um, that sometimes immediate landscape emissions don't necessarily, right? And and that's gonna be it's gonna be something we're gonna have to uh, take on. Here, here's a question for AJ. Um, how significant were costs to carry out the mitigation and the construction example that you provided? And then how would you recommend engaging um, the larger sector uh, uh, versus you know, individual stakeholders, an individual building owner, for example, versus the construction sector, I think is what that means. Yes, I think, you know, uh, when uh, I think we started this program, so when uh, I think we started discussing with the uh, construction people, so the environmental thing, you know, that that's that's what they said to us. And after that, I think another misconception among this industry, look, when you, whenever anything comes to the environment, you know, if you go, if you think in an industrial perspective, or an industry's perspective, they think it's it's a very costly affair, you know. So they it's not in their priority that we all need to understand. You know, they everybody wants to earn money. So that's the thing. So then there was they were assuming that there would be, I think if, if they are implementing any kind of mitigation action, it would be very costly. So then firstly, we convinced them that we are going to use very, you know, that I think economic things on your site. So in that way, because that site was to just to show other builders. And fortunately, after doing that site, now uh, the, that I, I was working in Indian state, Gujarat. So now Gujarat, the entire state is saying that, please follow, I think they are requesting their other industrialist and businessman and the, for their construction purpose to so follow these things because it's not that much costly. You know that, so that's how, because we have to convince in a way and mostly in a, you know that economic way you know that how it's going to affect their project cost a project cost is going to be very high no one is going to you know that use it they'll show it to you you know in a different way but they are not properly going to use it so you have to be very practical so in that way i think we tried in that way and we were successful yeah it does seem cost is something that you know we haven't i don't think grappled with a lot, but we've seen, you know, three different tools here. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on cost as, so we think about maybe moving these tools into real practical application. I mean, Emma showed an example from Los Angeles, Leslie, you know, very big, but impressive system. Um, how, how are we gonna, you know, at what point should we, or are we already thinking about cost? And, and I guess fundamentally who's gonna pay? So, for example, you know that I can tell you an example of uh, it's, there is a smoke gun kind of thing, you know, that that's like spread the smoke smoke into, into the atmosphere and like the cost of that smoke gun, I can, you know, the, if you are doing any kind of construction activities, you have to use that big smoke gun. It's very costly. The running cost is very expensive. You know that that's so, so for builder perspective, it's very costly that he, he, he will sometimes follow like because of the regulation you know, that force, but in, I think, I think internally he don't want to do that. So for that, I think if we can use simple sprinkling thing, you know, that like very like water sprinkling, that is also giving us similar kind of benefits. And we tried in that way only because, and also, especially, you know, that when it comes to the big things, you know, that the costly is small builders, you know, they, they don't have that much money. So for them, I think anyways, we have to develop some kind of practical solution and these practical solutions are working. For example, a truck was going from like one pavement and the pavement was, I think, you know, there was no, no stone or something pebbles on it. So what we did, we simply just put pebbles on it. That's it, you know, or some kind of water tank before, I think, you know, before trucks enter into the site. So that would wash the, you know, the truck uh, tires. So that's that kind of small, small intervention we were doing. And that was very useful, you know. And another challenge which we observed, like whenever we are asking something to the builders, they, they were in denial mode always. So we, we had to convince them it is going to be, I think, not that much costly, it would be cheaper. So that's how we were you know, that like trying to, and hopefully we'll have a, one research paper on it. So we'll, we are going to compare the different costs. 
Okay, so we have a couple minutes and I have one question that I wanted um, to pose and get everybody's quick thoughts on in the two minutes we have left, which is in your experience developing tools and, and perhaps interacting with decision makers, what, what do you see as, as the largest barrier to adoption right now? Um, and jump in, however, knowing that we just got a couple of minutes before we need to close. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I think for us, one of the challenges that we see is at the federal government level, we've done a good job developing new and different approaches. They're not all aligned. And so this idea of moving from different approaches to consensus, to authoritative information, that's, I, I think, the central challenge that we're trying to address with these systems. And I think if we could speak with one voice, we would do a lot better in serving the, the uh, needs of, of stakeholders, as we've heard throughout the day today. Yeah. I'll go next. So I feel that uh, uh, somehow we as an environmental people are not able to convince them or the translate what we are saying to the city. You know, for example, when you say emissions are increasing, instead of that, we can say that these activities, we can work on like miles traveled reduction or in their language. So that is the important thing. If you, if you want to drive something on the ground, you have to talk in their language, not in our language. That's what I uh understood my my experience communication yeah Emma? Just, um both of the the ideas that were already presented and and take it a little bit higher of just user experience um you know i think what i encountered quite frequently was a lot of decision makers getting a little bit wary about all the different tools and quantification methodologies that are out there and so just a little bit of kind of apathy of like, oh, there's so many, how am I supposed to know which one to use? And I can completely relate with that. Um, but also, you know, for many people, you know, we use the language that is very different. And so especially when we're talking with community stakeholders, you know, being being clear on the terms and and, you know, the key messages that we're trying to drive, I think, is is really important as well. So I kind of just stole two ideas, but I think they're very important. So I wanted to elevate them. Yeah, um, those are all those are amazing. I'm like writing them down. This is gonna be a good little tick list. Um, I would just add to this also um, just understanding um, the political realities that, you know, what what is it what makes a political win for them to do something and um, and also what makes it financially uh, viable. And I think that obviously financing for all of this is, is, is huge. So I think, um, those are two nuts we have to crack, uh, at, at the same time as we address these other, these other drivers. Okay. That, that was great. Thank you to each of you for excellent presentations and being so both on time with presentations and succinct and answers. That was wonderful. Um, that I will close this session and now we go into a 30 minute break uh, before we head into our final synthesis wrap up session. So thanks again. Come back to our National Academy uh, Greenhouse Gas Emission Information for Decision Making. And now we are gonna begin our uh, synthesis discussion. So we brought back a number of the panelists uh, that we had earlier in the day. And we wanna try to facilitate a conversation now uh, focus on opportunities for urban greenhouse gas information moving forward. And Kevin and I will moderate this discussion. Again, looking forward to hearing the questions from our audience. So please use Slido to submit your question, upvote questions, and we'll bring those into the discussion. Uh, Kevin's now going to introduce the speakers. Yeah, or I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So if you're just tuning in, as Anne-Marie said, we've got um, panelists from certainly the last two sessions and I think even the first. So I'm gonna um, run through everybody's name, give just a brief intro for those that are tuning in. And let's start with Philip Fine. Hi everyone, I'm Philip Fine. I'm the executive officer of the uh, Bay Area Air Quality Management District in the San Francisco Bay Area, formerly at EPA and in the Southern California uh, version of the Air Quality Management District. Uh, Robert Stupka. Hi, Robert Stupka, Head of Climate Action Implementation for North America at C40 Cities. I work with our 17 member cities in Canada and the United States in 
both uh, achieving their greenhouse gas uh, reduction targets and supportive actions and supports we provide to the region. Michael Ogletree. Michael Ogletree, I'm the director of the Air Pollution Control Division for the state of Colorado. Um, prior to this, I was at uh, the city and county of Denver overseeing their air quality program. Leslie Ott. Hey everybody, I'm Leslie Ott from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, I work in a place called the Global Modeling Assimilation Office, where we're working to develop uh, both computational models and information systems that, that help uh, improve the dissemination of information of both greenhouse gases and atmospheric composition. Emma Lewin. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Emma Lewin and I work at RMI, uh, working specifically on our city's team to advance uh, an equitable low carbon transition uh, in urban areas globally. Catherine Atkin. Thanks, yeah, Catherine Atkin. I'm from uh, the uh, Stanford Law School's Center for Legal Informatics. I'm an attorney focused on climate data policy. Glad to be here. Uh, AJ Nagpur. Is AJ not with us? AJ, you out there? Not on. If not, okay, let's go to, because I know we have some of the speakers from session one, so maybe uh, Ron Cohen. Hi, uh, Ron Cohen, a professor at uh, University of California, Berkeley, and I work on observations and greenhouse gas information systems for cities. Kim Mueller. Hi, this is Kim Mueller. I'm sorry, my internet's not working so great. So I have my camera off just to keep bandwidth at a manageable level. But anyways, I work at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the greenhouse gas, uh, sorry, in the greenhouse gas program. Yeah, sorry that I interrupted you. And I don't think Yvonne is on. Yvonne, are you there? Okay. Okay, so um, let's start off. Uh, Panel, we, we um, reminding everybody to put questions in the Slido, um, but maybe uh, both Anne Marie and I had a few things that we thought would be interesting, maybe to return to um, that came up as sort of themes in the really in all three sessions. Um, but maybe I'll start uh, with a question, just start to stimulate thinking here. Um, I'm going to go back to the thoughts on financial models for a greenhouse gas information tool for cities. What, what might this look like from your perspective? What are the challenges or opportunities in building some sort of model? Um, and maybe, you know, how do we, how do we finance this um, if we need to? And I'll open it up to everybody, just jump in. Uh, I can I can jump in. I mean, I think one idea would be that that there's a role of federal government to pay for it, given that all the collective actions roll up to achieving national level targets. And there's a critical role of national governments to fund infrastructure, set energy policies, and certainly with the Inflation Reduction Act providing uh, incentives. So being able to have the right data to work with and the standardized framework for cities to use as they're applying for funding and those actions being recognized helps create that, that uh, beneficial relationship between uh, federal commitments and, and city action. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's, there's rationale for federal government to pay for this and, and certainly as well spur private sector from, from relying on that data as well. Yeah, and maybe maybe I can chime in um, and just say that I, I think um, one of the challenges we're faced with uh, in trying to spin up these initiatives at NASA is we're doing our best to spin things up quickly to get information out, uh, which I think is good. And so that means leveraging existing systems, trying to find commonality with other initiatives. So for example, we're using cyber infrastructure that's common across projects at NASA, so we're not paying for all of that cyber infrastructure, we're sharing the cost across um, different uh, different programs. Um, also trying to leverage the connections between weather and air quality models, um, you know, both to provide more complete information, but also for efficiency, right? Because that's allowing us to give people the most complete information and to, to share uh, costs on the supercomputer's data systems, right? Um, 
but you know, one of the, the things that I think we're faced with right now is figuring out we can't possibly meet, you know, customized deployments for each city. So how do we build in the attributes that get to the kind of information that cities, states, and, and federal stakeholders all need, but also allow some room? for communities, um, great initiatives like RMI to make their own tools that go a step further. And I think that's really where finding the right balance, the federal government is is, is doing a lot and trying to, to take ownership of its part of the problem, but we also recognize we're not the only player in the room. And so figuring out what that balance is, how do you share and demonstrate this, this range of tools and recognize that there's going to be different components led by different groups. I think that's one of the key challenges and near-term needs is figuring out how those dis different components of the system all work together. I just wanted, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in the queue, Catherine, but I just wanted to mention as from the afar, the abyss of the no name abyss, a uh, picture abyss, but I wanted to mention that there was a federal strategy to advance an integrated US greenhouse gas monitoring and information system, uh, an RFI that was put out uh, a couple of months ago by the, the White House uh, for, for um, request for information. And this is an active point of discussion that is being bantered around at the highest levels of the US government right now. And um, it's certainly within the federal radar. So um, I would expect that that strategy to come out sometime in the end of the summer um, after the responses have been addressed. So I, I, I guess I'm just putting out there that there is some hope there. Uh, I can't, I'm, not, I'm low level on the totem pole. I just know that that's out there, but um, certainly something that's being considered. If I could just uh, jump in there and add, um, I do think this question of deployment and scale is huge. And I do I do think um, putting some pressure, um, I'm not one of the people here creating the data to, you know, let the, let the best data scientists win. If you can create scalable models at a certain cost, like I think we need to build that in to the innovation pipeline. And also I would just say, you know, things are marketable also, you know, we, we, we've heard this from different panelists and I brought it up. We do need, uh, you know, city governments need confidence in the data and in the standard and in the pipeline. And if we're gonna put forth, you know, new next gen solutions, we need a process we need a standard, we need a repository, we need a place that says these are ready to go. So I think that that's part of the, uh, the foundation to create a market, a viable market. Yeah, that's a great idea to uh, turn to next, Catherine. I think we did hear that from many of our speakers about the uh, desire to have maybe more consensus, consensus and authoritative data so that they uh, know this is reliable and usable. Um, and also some sharing of lessons so that uh, people don't end up having to reinvent the wheel. Um, Ron, I'm gonna go to you and then follow up probably with a little question for Michael and Phil. So go for it, Ron. So I wanna remind everyone that there are lots of things out there where they're important and engaging the, the wider community that are not authoritative. The, there's a vast amount of carbon trading having to do with putting carbon into forests that the average scientist would say is nonsense. And yet it's uh, it's taken over in the financial markets. There's a tremendous amount of investment driven by it. So we, I, we shouldn't be letting the perfect be the enemy of the good in what we're doing because that we might we might move the needle quite a bit with things that are more reliable than what's out there without saying we're all standardized and on the same thing. And I, I think that also points to an, another audience that might pay for this. So I've at one point had conversations about, could we measure the output of every power plant in some geographic region with hourly frequency? And, and I investigated who would make money on that. And the answer is people who are day trading and carbon permits could make money on that and then we could release the data every six months and make it public at that point, and they would already have made their money, and that might be a way to finance something like that. So there's 
other kinds of finance that might be important to the extent that uh, markets are involved in uh, changing the way we emit CO2. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those are good reminders, Ron, of, uh, I, I, yes, the <laughs> perfect is definitely the enemy of the good, and this is an arena that where that really, really rings true. Um, Michael and Phil, I just wanted to tap onto you guys in this discussion of um, the the sharing of information, sharing of lessons learned, you know, any thoughts, given what you heard here today, are there some tools or information that you were unaware of that you see could have benefit or forums that uh, researchers you're hearing from today might get engaged with that are, are sources of information for you and your community that we maybe could connect with and just haven't at this point? Um, I don't necessarily have a direct answer, but I think you've heard even earlier today that uh, cities, counties, air districts, states are really underfunded for this type of work. It's very hard to find even the expertise to do this type of work. Uh, so whatever tools or forums that could exist need to be extremely accessible and easy to find. It shouldn't require, you know, traveling halfway across the country for a conference for a week. A lot of us don't have that type of those resources. Um, I mean, there's lots of good examples of peer-to-peer -peer learning models. I think Kevin talked about some of those already that it's, you know, just websites, clearinghouses. Um, uh, you know, I think, you know, set tools, meaning like models and and, and things like that. Well, while, while some areas may have expertise to learn and adapt those, most areas will not. Um, but it's, it's just, it could get even more basic than that. It's, it's just like, you have some questions about emission factors. You just have some questions about, you know, sort of the economic implications of certain things. Like just getting a place where that could all be shared and where the debates have happened, like being able to tap into debates that have happened in other places as you're preparing to enter your own local debate. Um, and, you know, I don't know how to connect all the dots or maybe there are some kind of relational databases just for information that can do that. But it just has to be easy. I have to be able to tell my staff, like, go to this place, you'll find all the information you need and they can do it in a day or two versus, you know, a, a six month training. Right. That's actually practical, useful information. Phil. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Michael, what are your thoughts uh, given your experiences in Colorado? Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd echo, you know, Phil's comments. Um, and, you know, for us in Colorado, it's something as I've, you know, mentioned during, during our panel discussion earlier, you know, we have different challenges at the state level than um, a lot of cities. Um, so a lot of the tools that we're, we're looking to uh, employ um, are some of the ones that were, you know, previously discussed, but, but then also developing our own tools. Um, it's something that is, is really required and, as Phil mentioned, most entities don't have as much funding. Um, fortunately, we're in a place where we do have, you know, um, significant funding to be able to support the in-house development, but also leveraging what's what's being provided and, and being developed in other areas as well. I'm just going to add one more thing, and this gets to the, maybe not exactly the question, but just putting in a plug for the financial models. There's definitely a financial model for life cycle assessments because every private... <laughs> consulting company has their own model now and that's it's like the wild west you can go model shopping um that has to at some point be reeled in i don't see anyone who could do that other than the, the federal government yeah good topic bill yeah yeah kevin you have some other questions queued up yeah i have a, actually one that i'm curious about um particularly for people in the practitioner space, you know, there's been a lot of development and emphasis on, on real-time data or very near real-time data, um, particularly in the scientific community. I'm wondering how, how important is that to, to, at the practitioner level? Is that, you know, and by real-time, you know, do you need last week's information? Is that helpful or, or is that not something that can be used? I can start. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Michael. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, for us, you know, the the real time or near real time data is is less useful um, because for us, a lot of the changes that we're making are at the regulatory level. So more accurate historical data to inform policy is is more useful for for my team. Um, certainly tracking some of the progress, but I mean, the progress tracking, it's not week to week, you know, it's year to year or every two years. Um, so the near real time data is less useful for, for us, but I can, I, I would, I would guess like depending on, you know, the individual entity and how small scale you get that week to week data may be more valuable as you know, you're looking to make decisions about a specific building. If you're the building owner or something like that, you might be able to learn something, you know, based on, you know, what's going on in the environment during any given period of time, which will help you make, you know, decisions in the future, but, but less so um, at the state level. I would agree with one exception. Um, and that would be, you know, for incidents, um, if you did have a big incident, either just to quantify uh, what happened during that incident. It could have been an hour, a day, um, but uh, that 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 ends up being quite important. And then in the terms of sort of compliance, and if, if a problem that you don't know about uh, could be identified, a leaky pipeline uh, uh, or something like that, where you can have a faster response than waiting you know, weeks for it to be discovered, uh, having that type of real-time data could be uh, very useful. Yeah. I can jump in. I mean, we just came out of COVID and there's a number of interventions cities have experimented with. And so, you know, the question is, what are those discrete, um, you know, interventions? What is the impact of those on behavior and, and, and can you quantify impact on air emissions and greenhouse gases, right? And so, um, you know, the other aspect of it is just our, our energy use is uh, shaped by peak demand. And so if we're able to really understand what is happening during those peak demand usages, what is happening when we have concerns about uh, grid resilience, uh, you know, what, what, what is the impact, um, what, you know, energy facilities are coming online uh, when our grid is strained, uh, you know, those are the types of things that really do have a time uh, aspect of it that needs to be at a, at a higher resolution to really um, make meaningful, uh, you know, th decisions and, and, and make it matter. And I think, you know, ultimately those peaks, because you design systems for those peaks, um, have an impact in terms of the design of our future uh, energy infrastructure and is key to actually, you know, getting to that uh, zero emissions energy uh, system. Any other thoughts? Maybe I'll say just on the transportation side of it would be yeah. the other one in terms of trip behavior. And so, Again, like if we're looking at any at specific city uh, policy level interventions, um, specifically looking at shortening trips or or you know mode shifts, um, ultimately that that affects commuting patterns and, and and how those trips are being done. And, and so is is there measurable uh, impacts? Uh, and then with like the wildfires now, we're we're seeing on a regular basis in in many uh, cities as well. You know those extreme events um, have have a big impact, and, and you know how poor that air quality is. Um, you know, and the compounding impacts of even uh, you know weather and humidity and things like that. That all has an impact to help inform you know building the case to better buildings um, and, and and investment in the in grid resilience, for example. Thanks for those comments, Robert. Um, let's see, we've got a question coming in from Slido. Um, yeah. we, it's, we focus a lot of attention on having the right tools and technologies to reduce the greenhouse gases that are in a way consistent with state or city or organization goals. Uh, and what approaches could be used to ensure that local government or organizations set the best, best goals for their operations? Um, and this, you know, this may, I guess, have a economic flavor to it or a co-benefit flavor or with thoughts on, on helping these organizations and governments uh, set the best goals. Catherine, I see you're unmuted. You want to give it a try? Uh, yeah, I was, I was unmuted 
this entire time, but yes, I'm happy to speak. I was interested. I'd, I'd love to hear what Robert from C40 has to say on this as well. But I, I would, uh, I would say when you think about you know what these goals are, and I think that we've got state and national. I mean, we're focused here on the sort of this at the city level, and as we know, these net zero commitments are um, kind of they're, they're broad, right? They're sort of a a mile, I wouldn't, they're definitely a mile wide. I don't know if I'll call them an inch deep, but I do think uh, we should be thinking about those drivers of, of GHG emissions in cities. Um, the, as we know, transportation, buildings, um, you know, sewer systems and services. And then I think really beginning to um, lean into what it, what kind of due difference are going to be required to, to meet that net zero goal. I guess my point is, net zero is is going to force us to do a lot of things that are going to be difficult. Um, and so I think that really focusing on what those major drivers are and what are the, the policies and financial arrangements. And I think Ron made a great point about we've got to monetize uh, this in different and creative ways, um, whether that's you know green bonds uh, or creating uh, credit markets that make it more possible for cities to see an upside in making some of these changes, which will, you know, certainly we want federal and state money as well. So it's going to be a combination of all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to jump in. So, I mean, what we've seen examples of in Seattle and Denver is you're seeing cities leading on policy and, and being kind of test beds and then states um, then adopting statewide regulations to kind of follow. Um, even you know, city of Vancouver was given unique municipal powers to be able to uh, uh, test policies and put in their zero emissions building code requirements and, and basically reduce the risk of uh, the state or the province from kind of being the first one in. And so those are the opportunities for, for collaboration is recognizing that cities could. Um, big limiting factor in most cases, the cities don't have um, you know, that many powers and the powers need to be given to them from the state to be able to test these things. But if, if, that, if there's a recognition of that, then there's opportunities for willing cities to be able to act and see where they go and, and then to provide that broader based um, uh, overarching politics needed to kind of move, move together uh, faster. Um, the other thing is the recognition is needed of the zero emissions commitments of cities um, by regulators when there is uh, applications for either the electrical grid or the fossil gas um, system and 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 you know how does you know this you know tw uh, zero emissions by 2050 how does this you know fossil you know phase out uh, planning or building performance standard actually factoring into the investment decisions of infrastructure um, there's a there's a disconnect in that right now and it is a is a real question in terms of it, these actions need to be recognized no different than uh, you know a, a mining company you know going to an electrical utility and saying you know we need you to have include us in your resource plan uh, for our future energy needs. Um, these are how policies and, 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 and we plan energy systems and, and there needs to be recognition of, of where the cities want to go and their commitments. Thanks. Emma, any thoughts on this topic from your perspective and your work? Yeah, I mean, I think just to kind of echo a bit of what's already been said, especially around kind of the boundary issue that's came up quite a bit um, in our engagement on developing the city climate intelligence initiative of just, um, you know, what is in a city's toolbox and, and what isn't. And, you know, there's, there's that question, but then there's also the question of, well, how can we use this kind of data to help advocate for what Rob just kind of uh, suggested of empowering cities and, and giving cities those power to take a little bit more control over, you know, emission sources that are in their, are, you know, technically in their boundary, but aren't jurisdictionally in their boundary. And so um, that's something that, you know, has come up quite often and is really an interesting challenge that I think any kind of data system or greenhouse gas um, emissions monitoring or measurement is going to have to be, you know, flexible and in taking uh, into account for sure. Go ahead, Phil. Well, just sorry, one, one dynamic that's at play here is um, as a, a local entity is doing climate planning, they're often assuming, you know, certain things are going to come at the state or federal level or vice versa. And sometimes, you know, whether you 
put that in your baseline assumption or not, whether it's a, an actual law or regulation versus just a lofty goal. There's a lot of questions about how these things uh, thread together. And sometimes, you know, even within a single state and in, in amongst state agencies, there's a lot of inconsistencies around the assumptions uh, for different types of planning efforts in energy and transportation and air quality. So I think that's a, a big question where if, if everyone's assuming something's going to happen, but nobody's really responsible for making it happen, then every it sort of sort of falls apart and you might have had to do your planning a little bit differently. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's the beauty and the downside to the multi prong approach that we take to most everything we do in our government systems. Um, cool. The question yeah. in Slido, if you want to, I can read this one out. This is interesting. Um, to what extent are cities using offsets to reach net zero goals and would a federally blessed or federally ordained offset standard be helpful and likely to be widely adopted by cities if one existed? Anybody? I'll just jump in that our climate action plan framework doesn't really allow the use of, of offsets at this point. And so the, the message really is that, you know, cities need to do everything within their, their control and, and, and influence to be able to get to that zero emission pathway. You know, I, I'm still not clear in terms of the real, you know, offsets that really can be achieved. Um, you know, that, that doesn't include just, just passing on emissions kind of from one entity to the next, um, but particularly if the end point is going to be uh, zero emissions from everybody. <laughs> Um, it, it, I find the offset discussion more of a distraction from some of the more challenging things that need to happen. This right, is Kim. just direct mitigation. Mm -hmm. This is Kim. I can't speak to the federal um, a federal standard for offsets um, because we would be uh, very far away away from that. But I am more interested about Ron since you deal with. Um, you know, act, specific activities that have to do with infrastructure projects or so on and so forth and measuring the impact from those. That's probably the closest thing that I know of that has tried to get to some sort of measure of some sort of um, try to get to that offsetting question. Uh, so I think there's sort of maybe three different things. There would be projects that are mitigation so those are of the variety that Rob just talked about that we could have a, a uniform way of vetting uh, the greenhouse gas reductions associated with them. And um, that requires some sort of model of what would have happened absent the project. And that's the ends up being the trickiest part. There are projects that are sequestration. Um, and so that's a category of um, net negative CO2 that might be, or, or mitigation that would be different than some of the biological mitigation. And then there are some, I, I would say there are some mitigation projects that could be monitored in a way that are like, seem to be working. So the folks who are looking at uh, using urban compost in a way that uh, increases soil carbon uptake in rangelands, um, seem to have you know, much stronger evidence than some of the other kinds of projects that are getting more press. So I think looking a little more carefully at what's out there might lead us to you know, at least look at some class of the projects um, and be able to monitor them more effectively and, and trust them more, um, agreeing that the, you know, the ex most of the existing projects that are getting press are um, nerve wracking at best. Yeah, and that, you know, that comment makes me, reminds me that, um, you know, it's often, it's not enough to have just data for even history or now is that, you know, you need to have some modicum of scenario capability to be able to look, you know, to paths in the future. And that poses its own set of demands since that, that can be a difficult thing to do. Um, and, and maybe more importantly than just projecting out into the future, based on some baseline and, you know, sort of IPC scenarios type, type of thing is, is the fact that, um, a, you know, a lot of policies will tend to be sector or technology specific, 
but they'll have lots of interactions in a in a complex environment like a city. And some of the, you know, we want them to all be co-benefits, but they're not always, right? That that they can have lots of interactions with other things. I'm thinking about social justice and equity, right? You can have really unintended consequences about policies relating to that. Um, and that does pose some, you know, significant knowledge and technological demands to be able to fulfill uh, something like that. But it does seem important. Any thoughts on that? Kevin, just to quickly add on to that, I definitely yeah. agree. And I think that's kind of where it's also important to acknowledge the limits of what modeling and data can do and where you need to kind of start talking to the people on the ground and, and understanding um, and having that kind of community engagement. And so I think in a lot of these opportunities, you know, we, we have to be careful not to think of just our data uh, and greenhouse gas emissions data in a silo and the opportunity to be able to bring that to those that are kind of living in these cities and experiencing these cities and and kind of showing them the data and then also getting their reaction to it and and it's it seems like it's a you know a two-way conversation for sure uh, yeah i would just jump in on this one and and just say that i think that equity as a driver for public policy is um very is a very strong one in cities and i think there's a real opportunity if that is done and well to um you know and garner support and political uh the kind of political buy-in you need when there's scarce public resources so i i'm really you know you mentioned this idea the co-benefits and i think the idea that we can look at mitigation uh alone solutions and expect to like you know, have people roll out the red carpet, um, you know, just that isn't, that isn't and shouldn't be the way it goes. I think we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. And so I loved, you know, I think a couple of you all have your solutions include air pollution. I think that thinking about extreme heat and and the, the fact that low-income communities are often the ones experiencing the effects of climate change in our own communities and is really powerful. So I think that's, um, as a level of complexity, but if we don't get that right at the beginning, I think we'll we won't have the impact we want. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Awesome, thanks, Catherine. Kevin, shall I move to a little discussion on uh, scales of information? Sure. So we had a, a question from uh, the audience, which ties into some of the discussion we had earlier today about the spatial resolution of information. Um, so they are thinking about what is the value of information that say at the census block when you're trying to develop policy or when do you really need to drive down to these smaller scales like I, Emma showed us some really disaggregated information at the, the building level street level um, so just let's talk a little bit about where it is you need to have that very fine resolution and where more aggregate uh, will serve our needs. Certainly when trying to deploy energy efficiency programming, um, the, the fine resolution really is helpful because you have maybe a, a certain buildings of certain types and vintage. Uh, you're trying to figure out what are the, what is the split of, of energy sources. Oftentimes you don't have the breakdown between space heating and hot water uh, with you know total electrical demand. So just being able to um, be targeted um, in terms of what are the various interventions required in certain neighborhoods and how you engage with those communities uh, is really helpful. And I think in an earlier discussion as well, we spoke on the transportation side of it and the real opportunity as well to uh, you know reduce air pollution from transportation and do some targeted neighborhood scale uh, interventions. And Ron, I know your program really does get that data collection at a, a very fine resolution across the city. So what are some of the biggest surprises you found in having that new kind of information? Um, so I think there's sort of two things you might think about. One, one is uh, work, uh, you know, our approach of a graded inventory or our colleagues who are driving around. Um, I think there's a class of sort of finding the sort of leaks that Phil was talking about that um, and, uh, things that are not in the inventory, whether it's industry or it's a place where 
you're not tracking the fact that dozens of idling trucks show up contributing to poor air quality and high local greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I think that's one set of sort of the kind of thing you get from high resolution observations and modeling. Um, and then it's intersection with air quality. Um, and I think the other thing you get is a process scale information. So on the electricity side, maybe the sorts of things we just heard about are, are straightforward, you know, knowing whether a building is using natural gas or electricity for its heating. And once you know that in a, in a class of buildings, then you can think about that whole class together. And what you're trying to know is where in space are buildings of type A or type B. But there are other aspects of the uh, greenhouse gas emission system that we're, we don't have good tests and we can't track and necessarily at the, at the meter. And so observations can help us uh, classify and characterize those so that even if there's only a subset of them in some census tract, we can take action across multiple census tracts knowing something new about the process. And I, I, don't, I don't have a good example of that, but I, you know, we did try and do some work, for example, measuring the speed dependence of emissions on the highway. Mm -hmm. We're able to verify that the usual models for speed developed, you know, at the individual vehicle level hold for the fleet. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's a good know. point. Yeah, the process in learning is a good uh, example of how we maybe don't need this information in every location everywhere, but enough so you start to understand underlying drivers. Yeah. Bill. I mean, just as an example, and Ron touched on it, there's been a lot of success in mobile monitoring of uh, natural gas leaks in neighborhoods and sort of rapid response to fixing those. I haven't necessarily seen, I'm sure it's been done, you know, with the, the, the emission reductions uh, associated with those types of programs have been, but that's very fine spatial scale, very quick action. I think more generally though, it's not so much the GHG emissions at that scale, it's more about all that other related data that we, we just talked about, you know, household characteristics, um, income, other types of things that come along with a GHG policy intervention that um, are really important to have, even if the emissions themselves could be handled on a, on a at an aggregate. Yeah, I wanna, I'll, I'm, maybe I'll, I'll ask Kim, to speak up because I, I recall um, this example in Baltimore. Kim, I don't know if you want to talk about that. I think it was, you know, that that um, had you aggregate information, you might not understand why some areas had high CO2 that intersected with low income, right? Kim, I'm, I'm, I am I'm don't want to steal your thunder. If you no, remember. go ahead. Keep you're, you're very good at explaining things. Keep going. <laughs> well, the reason I liked it is that it was what, what was interesting about this is that th there were low income parts of Baltimore it had very high CO2 levels, but it wasn't CO2 coming. I mean, it was CO2 from large interstates um, of throughput traffic. So it had nothing to do with the activity in the neighborhoods themselves. It was effectively imported CO2. And without, again, having the granularity and sector separation, you could be very misled by what you would see. And that's why kind of getting down into this detail starts to, um, combined with the texture of a city, starts to really give you insights into, you know, who's responsible or not responsible or how you're going to allocate mitigation and mitigation responsibility becomes really crucial. Going back to that social justice angle. Well said, Kevin, well said. Okay, I'm glad I did a good job. Uh, let's see, now we, uh, any other comments on that? Uh, there's a couple questions in Slido that I could, we can turn to. One thing, I do yeah, have ahead, one Kim. thing to, to that, um, and it has nothing to do with Baltimore, but it does have to do with the fact that we have done comparisons between cities, and it comes back to somebody saying that not all cities are alike, and not all available data from cities are alike, and so, for example, when I showed in my presentation, we did a uh, intra-city comparison during COVID between Los Angeles megacities area and the Washington, Baltimore, DC area. And what was interesting is that the types of data that we could get for, now granted, we have to go to publicly available data sets. We didn't, we don't have the luxury of getting utility data or those types of data sets that other stakeholders, 
people in the, the cities might have. So, but the amount of the types of data that we could get available that we were able to get our hands on for Los Angeles was very different than the types of data that we could get our hands on in the Baltimore DC area. And so the question then comes down to a level of, if you want to do this across cities, the level of consistency comes into play versus whether or not you want the best available data. Um, and depending on where you go, and then you have an interpretation question. So I just, we've, we found that to be really interesting and it was a definitely a choice we had to make when we did that specific study. Yeah. Just food for thought more than a, anything else. Let me just kick in one area. I think it's very specific where there's some variables in terms of, you know, when we're trying to figure out building energy usage at the building level um, and trying to figure out what the policies are, like the, the difference between, you know, real energy bills, real energy used versus modeled energy um, for reporting. And, and, you know, the differences can be quite vast. Um, it's hard to predict things like uncontrolled air leakage in buildings and, 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 and usage factors and things like that. And so, you know, how do we get high resolution utility data? Um, is the elephant in the room? Like it, it exists, but you know, various policies require a certain level of aggregation. And you know, what is an appropriate level of you know resolution and aggregation to be able to address privacy concerns, but also make you know have meaningful information to actually um, you know advance uh, policy and action. I, I think in that light, the, the New York City law on, on building energy is really transforming how uh, building owners are going after the, that very question of how leaks in their building and efficiency. And there's a bunch of small companies that have sprung up to work at the building scale with individual owners. Um, and so that's a, that's a place where policy spur to market and the market is actually, you know, despite, even despite the crazy high cost of carbon in, in those New York buildings right now. Yeah, uh, we're driving down carbon emissions quite a bit. Yeah, I've often wondered, um, even though it, it, you can't break through the privacy barrier of ratepayers, um, could you have a platform that encourages um, the voluntary submission of utility billing data, even though you're not going to get the population, but even samples could be quite powerful. Um, something that, you know, I would imagine these days a, a lot of ratepayers might might be willing to do if it was easy. If, if you could just click a box and then you have AI could figure out the rest of it as it, more information is gathered. I mean, I think it's conceivable to start to get way better um, information. I think one of the biggest problems is everybody's a rate payer or customer in their own house and in individual circumstance. And they really have no clue being oriented how good or bad they are relative to their neighbor. Um, and so, you know, I think especially what you're describing, if you're in a condo unit and you're able to disclose your own usage and your neighbor sees it and, you know, or you're able to get a number of points, I think that that could be really powerful. You know, the dashboard effect. Um, a question came up in Slido that kind of goes back to the supply chain, which is does seem to be an important topic. Um, the question is, deep socioeconomic decarbonization involves understanding greenhouse gas emissions through activities life cycle. How can the consumption-based emissions accounting be part of the broader context to inform decision-making? So a lot, lot wrapped up inside that. And we've touched on it a bit before, but it does seem to be just increasingly important, um, particularly at the smaller scales at the urban scale, for example. Anybody wanna weigh in on that? Well, you know, I think this is a, again, one of those where it has to be a both and because hmm. um, I'm a, I think consumption-based accounting is a very powerful tool. And um, as we know, especially, it's going to uncover that higher income um, areas, you know, at any at any level, are consuming more than low income areas. And I I think 
um, we, I think that the, the difficulty with the city level is um, you've got these climate action plans that were not, they're not based on that approach to GHG accounting. So I think we have to create some on-ramps for cities. And I do think it gets then to some really great databases of life cycle analysis so that you can make it easy because we're not all like, you know, you read Sweden's report and they did, you know, it's like they had yeah. whole, you know, wings of higher education, like focused on this. And I think those kinds of things are, you know, you talk about cities doing something that leads to greater action. I think when it looks that difficult, you're not going to get it to happen at scale. So I, but I think it's, it is uh, very important. And I'd like to say, I think the uh, compliance market for corporations is a mm. tailwind for us. I mean, between an SEC rule, climate rule that's supposed to be finalized soon, and then the EU and countries, we do have, I think, a sea change on the recognition that uh, supply chain is the driver for, uh, you know, climate impact. So I'm, I'd like to see those things sort of, you know, cross pollinating a little bit too. And, and Robert, with, did you? I thought you brought this up in the context of the C40. Um, consumption-based work. was Am I correct? Yeah, I mean, part of our leadership uh, standard requirements is going to be consumption-based emissions uh, actions in two areas by 2024. So it's coming, you know, where cities are going to dip their toe in is, you know, up to them. Certainly food is is, is one of those, you know, big ones where they have um, opportunity. Um, but I mean, I look at it from, from the perspective of, you know, yeah, the gl global energy and Right now, there's a lot of discussion around, you know, where's our energy going to come from? Uh, export of LNG, for example, to Asian countries uh, to displace coal, supposedly. Um, and and we know a lot of the production of goods is is coming from uh, other countries with high intensity energy, great uh, greenhouse gas. So how do we make that connection? So certainly on the consumption based emission side of it, and 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 now um, scope three reporting of of, of companies. Um, you know, can we start to uh, really take ownership of those emissions? Um, so it's not just kind of what, you know, what I'm, what I'm emitting in my backyard, but really what is the influence of, of what we are doing in terms of the emissions on a, on a global scale? Uh, I think, I think the conversations around this are nascent and, and there's a lack of awareness of this. And, and I think it's important policy lever. Certainly I could say from my perspective in Canada, you know, we have the highest per capita emissions of any country. Um, but we see ourselves as, you know, a little baby in terms of the, the big pie chart on total global emissions. Um, but we need to own it from the perspective of, of that consumption. That is that is where you're actually going to even get maybe more, more, more public to, to get behind action because recognizing that there's a real impact on, uh, on, on the global emissions, you know, from the higher emitting countries. Yeah, good point. Um, okay, let's see. You now we I was just reminded we have 10 minutes left. And maybe we'll um before we do a little wrap up, let's maybe have time for a couple more questions. Um, I don't know if Anne Marie, you have anything on your mind that's come up. I have one that I, you know, and it sort of um picks up on a couple of things that have just been said, which is in thinking about tools and strategies, particularly the urban scale, you know, it, it, is it even feasible to have a common tool? I mean, Emma showed CCI looks like a sort of a fairly common platformish tool. I think some of the observation systems that we saw, you know, can be applied anywhere. But, but then going back to this point about consumption-based accounting, where some cities are producer cities, some are consumer cities. I mean, they're very, very different. Um, is there room for a, a, a common tool, a common data, or, or are we always sort of chasing kind of tailored um, approaches? You know, within urban science, people always say, no, every city is different. And, and that's true to a certain extent, but they share lots of things in common as well. So I'm just curious what people's thoughts are on that. But I mean, obviously, it depends on what kind of tool you're talking about. <laughs> well, yes, the greenhouse gas information tool. For... Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, but still, there's a you know, yeah. there's a yeah. lot of different types of those too. I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a tool, but maybe we could start working towards common frameworks. You know, yeah. the way like, like there's scope one, scope two, scope three is a common framework for considering things. Um, ensures that things aren't getting left out, that certain things are being at least considered. Uh, you know, you don't need you don't need the data, all the data to create an equation that other people have to figure out what to what to plug into it but at least agreeing on the equation is, is a step forward, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a lot of room, but in, in some cases, uh, I think some tools can be common. Um, it can always be customized. Making them open source yeah. is really, really important. So yeah. people can customize them and build modules and share. Uh, I'd put a, 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 <laughs> I'd strongly encourage that. So that gets back to the financial models that, generally isn't a favorable financial model, but um, yeah, it, I mean, it, I think it just really depends. We've talked about, you know, a dozen just on in, in the last hour of different types of tools that could, could be useful. So I think it just depends. Yeah. I I, say, oh, okay. sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say from a practical perspective, like what cities really struggle with is, you know, staff turnover, changes of emission factors over time. Um, updating old models, which, you know, they, they want to move forward on. And, and so like, what is, is, is there an automated approach? Is there an approach that can be applied consistently and doesn't kind of bog you down in, ter in terms of chasing data and, and, and reporting um, when really kind of what, what matters here is how is it informing, you know, action more than, more, more than anything. Um, and so, yeah, those are, Right. The current approaches are require a lot of, of legwork, um, and, and and there's a real challenge in terms of when updates are required and making sure you're measuring the same things even when you're trying to advance approaches. So when we're seeing these new, you know, potential hybrid options coming coming on, on especially maybe things like transportation emissions, which which can be challenging. Um, we need to ask the how, how does that work with their existing commitments and and past data inventories and what is appropriate to to accounting them. I mean, as well as what's appropriate for uh, the, the time scale now that we're kind of targeting 2030 and 2050 around things like methane emissions. And she'll be looking at shorter time scales for reporting um, is an important factor. I just wanted to say that in the federal government, I think there is this co coalescence around the fact that we are, whether or not <clears throat> it's necessarily specific to a one city or one stakeholder need that we are coalescing around the idea that this information is going to need to be provided at disaggregated scales. I can't tell you to what scale that will be or what spatial scale or what temporal scale and that it will largely have to be combined with, with air pollutants. And um, you already see the EPA right now disseminating information on greenhouse gases at the state level. We can argue about what that means, but there's obviously a push within the federal government to do this. So again, how that data is useful to each and every one of the stakeholder needs, I can't say, but um, there, it's gonna happen, I think, at the federal level. Yeah, and I'll just I'll chime in. I, I think there is going to be progress on the on that there will be progress on the federal level, but it's going to be, you know, an evolving conversation. I think, you know, some of Phil's um suggestions of where you could start with common frameworks. We know there's a lot of like basic things that need to be done on interoperability. Everybody says data formats are a challenge. There's a lot of things that are technical barriers that that we can make progress on near term um, while we have these dialogues and figure out, and it's gonna be a system of systems. I don't think there's gonna be one magic tool that can address all of the needs or, or really should, right? Because the federal government has limits in terms of what it's doing, in terms of making space for private industry, for, for other types of decision makers, there's always going to be this range of approaches. And I think having those conversations early to figure out um, how do we how do we make sure people are moving forward, but ideally growing together, right? And some 
some of that is figuring out scope in terms of who is doing what, but some of that is a very technical challenge of making sure that the data systems talk to each other, making sure that we have common definitions, formats, that we're moving towards those things and actually listening to uh, the, the people who are going to put into place some of those tools. I, I think that's really important. And the other thing that I think we hear a lot from stakeholders in other kinds of venues, and, and uh, you know, Robert just made this point, People are busy. There's a lot of staff turnover. You don't have time for another meeting. You don't have time to go across the country for a conference. So to the extent that tools can be built into workflows that are existing and are compatible with the tools people are already using, that's critical. It doesn't matter if you spin up the best new thing if somebody doesn't have time to train on it, right? And so I think that's where some early conversations that, you know, this is a great start. I think that's going to be valuable as, as you see these growing to make sure that they're all growing together in a productive uh, ecosystem of tools. That was awesome, Leslie. Kevin and I were just discussing how we need to find some uh, summary statements, recommendations uh, as we get to the closing minutes of our conversation here, but that was a good, uh, good starting point for that sort of summary of some of the threads that we pulled today. So um, I feel like we covered a lot of territory in this conversation we've had today. Uh, maybe some unanticipated, some expected, ranging everywhere from uh, what financial economic aspects of the problem, scales of data, consensus building, information sharing, et cetera. But my challenge to our speakers uh, as we bring things to a close, just very brief, do you, you have any sort of either theme or recommendation that uh, feels like it kind of uh, is a good closing point for the day from your perspective, given what we've heard and discussed today. And we may need to organize ourselves to do this. So I'm actually going to call names and start with Phil and then go to Michael. I would just say this has been great. And the more times we can lock policymakers and researchers in the same room and not let them out until there's yeah. an increase in understanding, the better. So this doesn't happen often enough and it can't happen too much um, because I mean, my career has been back and forth and I've noticed this disconnect is, is constant, is a constant theme. Okay, that, that was a good one, Phil. I wrote that one down. Michael, thoughts? Yeah, no, I mean, certainly what Phil said was that's what exactly what we're trying to do as well, right? Get get all of these different groups in, in, in the same place. I would just add, you know, from a regulatory perspective, you know, thinking, like listening to all the conversations today um, is helpful as we think about regulatory frameworks that allow for flexibility. And one of the challenges we have as a regulatory agency in, in a state who's put forth some of these different goals is how we continue to evolve um, and change the technologies we use to meet those goals while also considering how we go back and reset baseline ba based on the changes that we now know. Um, yeah, good, 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 thank you. Um, here we're gonna reach out to Kim. We don't have video, but I know you've got her on the uh, audio. Any closing thoughts, Kim? Um, gosh, you, I, I didn't expect you to call on me with, since I, my video was turned off. I thought I was going to dodge the bullet there. But anyways, mm -hmm. I, um, I'm i going to go back to my, my final thoughts at my session is that, um, you know, we're going to be pushing for standardizations and standardization is really important, it, whether or not it, we're doing things in a separate, slightly separate way across cities um, or um, in a similar way. And I would encourage everybody who's on this call or listening in to support the standardization process um, because without that, then nothing is comparable. And um, like, we'll, like I said before, we'll all be operating in the Wild West. So that's my last word, Anne-Marie. Oh, yes. All right, like, like the NIST perspective. Uh, Ron, thoughts from you? Um, so I, I want to say that I'm, I'm pretty excited about the opportunity in front of us. I think we've uh, collectively built a set of tools that we can use to drive progress. And I want to volunteer to be locked in a room with my colleague, Phil, anytime he's ready. <laughs> that's good. Well, you guys are even in the same town, so that's quite possible. Excellent. Emma, some thoughts? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the the main theme I'm taking away today is just optimism. There's so many really interesting and important things that are moving, and I would say agree, moving quickly. Um, and so kind of taking, you know, an optimistic approach to being able to have these conversations with with cities or or other implementers of of uh, carbon reduction actions and being able to kind of, yeah, come from a place of of uh Applied hope, as we would say at RMI. So, yeah, that's a good one. Applied hope. I like that, Emma. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, I mean, I think it shows that you know what we need, the data that we need, depends on the actions, and we need to focus on getting the right evidence that we need to support the actions that we need to do, which might be different how we may have looked at inventories in the past. If we want to do inventories with purpose, we really need to understand that and, and, and let that lead. So that could be a, a very localized disaggregate level. It could have a temporal or, or spatial aspect of it. And um, yeah, so the long list of, of potential ways to get that, um, you know, all of the above, I'd say, and we just need to be intentional about how we use that data. Great. Thank you. And Catherine? I just love what Rob said. I mean, I think it's... Um, you know, fit for climate purpose data. And I really appreciated that this group didn't come in with its report. And our only job is to figure out how to scale like the like nirvana that we all see, but to really think about where we could go next and, and what what's going to actually accelerate decarbonization. And so anyway, I, I think y'all, I know you're done with your work, but it would be great to see a follow on that really looked at what kind of data is needed to solve what kind of climate, you know, mm -hmm. action challenges. I think that would be a great plus up on this report. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. All right. Well, we're running out of or already or out of time. I'm going to pass it back to our committee chair, Don, for uh, closing your remarks. Thanks. For you. Thank you very much. All of our panelists really appreciate participation. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Well, I want to thank you all as well. Uh, what a wonderful workshop. And um, I thank the panelists for their rich, informative discussion. And I, I know I certainly learned a lot of, from it. Um, for anyone that doesn't have a report, you can download it uh, from the uh, National Academy site. Uh, just put in you know, the name and the beginning of the name and you can find it quickly. Um, and uh, one last message is that the recording of today's meeting will be available through the event website, uh, webpage. Um, so thank you all again. And um, this was really cool.